Hi, welcome. Welcome to everyone to this Atmospheric Science Day 2024. We're very, very happy to be here. I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Charmi Lino. I'm project manager at Climact. I've been part of the organization with my partners in crimes um, for today's session. It's the third edition. We're very, very happy to hold it once more here at the uh, UNIL campus. For those of you who don't know Climate much, I will briefly present us. We're a uh, UNIL and EPFL center dedicated to climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, atmospheric sciences are at the core of the science we support, so we're very happy to do it today. I'm sorry, I think I'm going to change the slide afterward. Um, uh, very, very happy to be here. We, what we do is we reinforce interdisciplinary and interinstitutional climate and sustainability research. I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, we work on implementation projects dedicated to climate change, uh, adaptation and mitigation. We give visibility, we try to give as much visibility as possible to our researchers, and that's why we're here today, because the session is recorded, it's going to be put online afterwards. And we create bond with different academia and civil society uh, stakeholders. Um, um, yeah, it's very important for us to hold this event today because it's central to what we do. But I'm not alone to do that. We have uh, we co-organized the event with the uh, ECHE, which stands for the Expertise Center for Climate Exper Extremes. I'm sorry, I'm going to redo that once more. Expertise Center for Climate Extremes with Tom Buckler from UNIL and with Hendrik Uvald from EPFL. And I'm going to let them uh, say a brief word about what they do. Thanks a lot, Charmini. Uh, so good morning, everyone. So welcome to this um, 2024 Atmospheric Science Day. Um, so on behalf of the whole ETRE team, we are very happy today uh, to be partnering with CLAMACT uh, for the organization of this, uh, of this uh, session of the Atmospheric Science Day. So I'm Erwan Koch, I'm the director of VHA, and I will give you a very brief introduction about what we are doing. Um, so we are an interfaculty center of the University of Lausanne between two faculties, so the Faculty of Geoscience and Environment and the Faculty of Business School and Economics, so HEC Lausanne. Um, and so in terms of topics, it's, uh, let's, I would say, less broad than CLIMACT, which deals with, like, uh, sustainability in a, in a broad sense. We are, we are focused on the quantitative aspects um, with two uh, main areas. So the first one is the forecast of weather extremes, weather and climate extremes. So climate extremes in a broad sense. Uh, so in terms of forecast, not uh, yet in terms of operational forecast. We are not like competing with Meteo Suisse by providing our own forecast uh, so far. Um, but like more from the methodological viewpoint. Um, and the second uh, aspect is more risk assessment. So from a, let's say, statistical or probabilistic viewpoint uh, to assess the risk associated with various perils in the current climate and in future climates, okay? Uh, so in terms of missions, we have two main. Uh, one, as a research center, is to produce interdisciplinary research, right? Uh, but it's, it must be geared uh, towards societal needs, so really in, con in, in um, tight connections with stakeholders uh, because of our second mission, which is to be somehow at the service of society um, to uh, address needs from uh, municipalities, from cantonal offices, federal offices, and private companies. Um, so, for instance, we are partnering with the city of Lausanne for surface runoff risk or the cantonal insurance uh, for hail risk. Um, and so in terms of, uh, let's say, main structure, so as you can see here, so there is the Faculty of Geoscience and Environment on the left, the uh, HEC Lausanne on the right. So we have uh, one, let's say, HA core team. Um, with uh, Amri Singh and Ryan Kotsakis, we, we just basically arrived very recently as research associate. And you can see Vietri as basically a set of research groups, uh, so the core team and then the research groups associated with the um, various professors who have uh, co-founded the center. As, so as you can see, there is an expertise in atmospheric physics, atmospheric dynamics, 
uh, atmospheric processes in a broad sense, geostatistics, hydrometallurgy. So this is more on the hazard side. And on the impact side, there is, uh, there is um, expertise in statistics, um, uh, risk quantitative risk management, risk modeling, and, and sustainable finance. So the idea here is really to, to have the modeling of the hazards and the modeling of the impacts, right? Put, put together a bit in the similar spirit as what is done in the um, NatCat community, where you always have the hazard module, the, the, the damage module, and the financial loss module. So that's a bit how we are structured. And of course, we have many partnerships with, uh, with Swiss and uh, international universities and the stakeholders I, I mentioned before. So yeah, that was my, my brief uh, HA presentation. So I will leave the floor to, to my colleagues. Thank you, Erwan. I'm going to keep it short to make sure we stay on time. I just wanted to wish everyone a very warm welcome. So we've been really lucky to have two successful editions of the Atmospheric Science Days. And of course, we have brilliant PIs and invited speakers. But I think what really makes this day special to me is that it's really the opportunity for early career researchers to present, um, ask any questions you would like. I don't think there's, there's rarely any. Some, um, sometimes people come up to me and say, oh, my question is stupid. But usually, the naive questions are usually the most profound. So I really want to encourage everyone to ask questions at the end of each talk. Um, be kind, be understanding. We all come from very different fields and have fun, enjoy this free food. There's a lot of good people. Um, I'm just so grateful for this day every time it's this, the highlight of my semester. So thank you all for coming. You're really what makes this event so special. Thank you, Tom. Also welcome from uh, my side. Uh, my name is Henry Kuwald. I'm a scientist at uh, the Cryospheric Science Laboratory at DPFL. Um, I think Tom mentioned a very important uh, point that this is uh, really an opportunity for the early career scientists and also one of the, uh, the key points for uh, creating this Atmospheric Science Day was um, to, to foster the link between the two uh, institutions here, uh, UNIL and EPFL, and because there is quite a bit of research going on in the domain of atmospheric science and uh, to have uh, an opportunity for exchange. And that's also the, one of the principal purposes of this day. And uh, yeah, also without, I think, further delay, I think we can start the session. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, you see the room is not completely booked. You're also free to move a little bit forward if you like to, or after the, the coffee break. And um, we will, the, the entire team with Isabel Charmeli and uh, our helpers will guide you through the day. And I think Charmeli has a few more information. And then we start the session. Thank you. Thank you. So as uh, Tom and Enric mentioned, the, the goals of the day, I'm just going to add a few more words about the logistics. Uh, basically, I'm going to be the timekeeper. I'm going to be sitting over there with my card one minute left. So you all know when uh, it's time to end your presentation. Everyone will have 10 minutes and then five minutes for Q&As. Microphones will be circulating around, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, very important to make this day dynamic. Um, the session is recorded and we're going to take pictures, so don't hesitate to let us know if you don't want to be uh, recorded or um, photos been taken of you. Uh, we're going to make sure uh, they're not anywhere in our communications. Also, you all have a voting card uh, where you can vote for your favorite posters and uh, talks. Um, the talks that are um, available for votes are the ones for, from uh, early career researchers. So uh, don't hesitate to write on the other side, on the recto verso, the, on the verso, your notes about today's uh, presentations and posters. And uh, after that, we're going to compile. Uh, we're going to compile. How do you say that? Yeah, compile the votes and uh, make uh, give some awards at the end of the day. Uh, there's a little basket at the entrance to put your votes in. And uh, here we go. Yeah. I will let Andre uh, chair the first session. Here is 
the program of the day, you're supposed to all have it uh, in printed versions. Okay, so no introduction. These sessions are not really topical sessions. Um, I think we can just call the, the first speaker, Brandon van Schaik from uh, EPFL Cryos Laboratory. And Brandon, we are very much looking forward to the first talk of the day. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so we just uh, go out here. Nick. Ah. Okay, we'll see. Uh, we are going to minimize can... that rate. And uh, it's on this folder. And then yeah, it should be in there. Except the top thing. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course. Thanks a lot. So good morning, everyone. I'm happy to wake you up this morning with some nice pictures of mountains and also some signs in between. Uh, so my name is Brandon. Um, I work on wind energy, mainly in the Alps, also in some other regions. But today we talk about the Alps, Swiss Alps. And I do measurements there to measure wind and compare it to wind turbines. So, I suppose I don't have to explain to you why we need to use renewable energy sources. Um, what I do want to tell you is there's some pros and cons to, to different sources. So I work on wind energy, so of course I want to highlight this image where you see well, wind energy. You see there's a lot of that in winter. Solar you don't get so much, hydro also not so much. So you need a combination of all of these, so all of these are important to use uh, if you want to have a proper coverage of renewable energy sources. And so. If you look then at how much wind do we have in Switzerland, this is the Swiss uh, wind atlas, you see that actually in the mountains you have the most wind. And that's really important because, well, if the wind increases by about 25%, your wind power increases by twofold. So basically, if your wind goes in the Alps here from uh, the, the blue region, that's kind of the low wind area, and then the red region, that's the Alps, you see the wind increases by a lot and you get a lot more wind energy. So if you want to build wind turbines in Switzerland, you probably want to build them in the places where it's very windy, which is the mountains. But there's kind of some pros and cons to that that I want to get into today. So last year I went to the Gotthard Pass uh, almost every week uh, to, to do some measurements. I call it the Gotthard Transect Experiment and I want to tell you a bit more about it. So. This is the Gotthard Pass. There's five wind turbines there um, from north to south here. And I just want you to pay attention to this little mountain indicated in orange. I'll get back to that in a minute, so keep that in mind. So you see these mountains are on top of a pass. The wind comes over either from the north or from the south. And so you get the wind energy from that. And what I look at is basically how do these wind turbines interact with the mountains. Uh, you see a lot of differences in power output there. So if we compare all the wind turbines to the Swiss wind atlas, you see in red, that's what the wind atlas says, what it's supposed to be, the amount of wind, if you calculate it with some modeling. And then in blue, that's actually what you get. And so what's interesting to see here is that for turbine three, for example, you have a lot more wind, um, wind power than we expected, whereas turbine four, it's much less. And these turbines are only about 400 meters apart. And so turbine four generates half the energy of what turbine three does without, with just being a couple hundred meters apart. So this was some of the reason why we thought, well, why does this happen? Can we explain that somehow? And so for that, I designed the following experiment. So now in red, you see the turbines and in orange, that is a LiDAR. A LiDAR is a machine that measures the wind using a laser pulse. You send it out into the atmosphere, you get to return back and you use the Doppler shift. It bounces off of aerosols and with that we can measure the wind speed. And so what I did, every week I went to the Gotthard Pass, took this machine, put it in a spot and then moved it. A week later I moved it along the transect from L1 to L2, etc. And so along this line what we can then do is show the wind above the mountains from basically zero meters up to about 300 meters way above the turbines and look at what the wind is doing there. So which direction is it going, how much speed is there, and does it have vertical components, things like that. And so what you can see from the wind roses you see on the left, so some explanation there. Uh, the top one is from turbine one, so in the north. The color indicates the wind speed, the size of this kind of 
uh, pi piece indicates uh, the frequency of the wind. And so the top pi piece, that means the wind is coming from the north. So what you see from turbine one is that the red part is kind of small, so there is a, a small amount of, of high wind. But then the bottom wind rose, not only do you see the wind has turned, so it's, it's moving through the mountains, it's kind of a challenge, channeling effect. Also, you see that the wind accelerates. So even though these are exactly the same particles of air moving, turbine 5 will extract way more energy from these particles than turbine 1 would. Why is that? Because the pass goes up and then comes down, and if wind gets compressed, the wind accelerates. So actually, you can use these mountains to even get more wind um, to extract from there, basically. So this is really interesting because then it's not, it becomes a question of where do I build my wind turbine? Because if I place it just a couple hundred meters to one direction, you can get double the energy from it. And so you need to build half the wind turbines, which I think is, is good in any way. So this is the LiDAR I was talking about. We scan in, in five different directions, vertically and then in all directions. So you get three components of the wind and we use this Doppler shift, like I said. And so these are some of the results. Again, now we see some wind roses. I plot a lot of them. Now it's just the colors, so you can see the frequency. So what you see if the wind is coming from the north, these, these top pie pieces, basically, you see the wind is going vertically, or like it's coming down to the south directly and then turns, and the other way around, it goes the opposite, but it's not exactly the same. You see there are some differences. This is like the, um, the momentum, basically, of the wind that you see in there. And so, like I said, this flow acceleration already, that increases turbine efficiency, but there's also components that decrease it. Turbulence, for example, there's a lot of turbulence in the Alps. Um, that's basically vibrations in the wind, so it doesn't become so efficient. Wind shear is if the wind, when you go higher, the wind increases or decreases in speed. Wind veer is when the direction changes with height. And then you have also some vertical components that also decrease the power output. Because if the wind is not coming in perpendicular, you get more strain on the turbine and it decreases the torque and therefore the power. And so, of course, these measurements, is, it's a big issue. We measure in one place at one time, but we never have two measurements at the same time in different places. So what I did is I designed an algorithm that could match these different um, locations and times basically with each other using the turbine data. So looking at the direction and speed of the turbines and then I compare them and if I say, well, these are very similar, then okay, then I can compare these measurements that I did with each other. And so with that, we can make plots like this. So this is along the transact. You see the wind going over the mountain. You see on the right, the wind is actually quite slow in the beginning, especially um, near turbine one. You see in red, that's indicated where the turbine is approximately located. You see the wind speed is low and then it accelerates over the pass, like we saw in the wind rows as well. And for example, at L8, you see a very strong shear effect happening. So you see at the bottom, the wind speed is much lower than um, 100, 200 meters up. Also, we can look at it from the top like this. So here we see in blue, that's the measurements close to the ground. In red, that's far away from the ground. You see that the wind changes in direction. And you see it's very strong here. You see it's almost like 45 degrees. So wind up there is moving at a completely different direction. So why is that? I hope you remember. It's this mountain we talk about. So I was able to take this very nice picture uh, during an evening on Gotthardt. Um, and you see the cloud is moving to the right of the mountain. So that is a different air layer. So this air is going around the mountain and then another air layer, the clear air is coming over top and it kind of makes a stratified layer. So that's just separate layers of air that move in different directions. And actually what you can see in turbine five, for example, that really experiences it very strongly, that the power on the turbine is much lower because the wind is going completely different directions and so it's not very efficient. Even though the wind speed is high, the turbine can't absorb it. Also, we can look at turbulence. So um, what we do is uh, we take turbulence kinetic energy. It's kind of just the energy of, of, of the vibrations in the wind, basically. And in blue, that's the interesting part. That's the median of this TKE. 
So basically, if the, the blue line goes as far further away from the black line, that means that there's more turbulence. It's, there's more turbulence in the air. And so what we see from that is if you look uh, on the right of these images, that's the north, you see the turbulence is, is usually a slightly bit higher, especially near turbine 3, that's the one uh, in the box there, and that we see also in the power output. So that brings me to the turbine performance. So these are box plots of normalized wind power, so I take different wind speeds and I normalize it to one wind speed, then you get a wind power. And then for each turbine, I split it up into north and south winds. And what you see for, for each turbine, the wind, depending on the direction, it really impacts how much power you get for the same wind speed. And that's just because of all of these effects. And so to explain some of these in turbine one and two, nearer north, we have much more turbulence and the power output is lower. For turbine three and five, we see the shear and veering effect from this mountain that I indicated. You see also the, the power output decreases by maybe 10% just because of the shear effect that always happens near this mountain. And we see some stuff that's overperforming. So above the gray dotted line, that's what you can expect from the turbine. That's kind of what in best case scenario you would expect. And this we can explain by actually an apparent uh, extra wind speed that's coming from turbulence because the sensor that's measuring the wind speed on the, um, on the wind turbine actually um, measures it wrong because of the turbulence and there's much more energy in the air actually and so then you get an outperformance. Then finally, just to close up, also in winter there's some differences. So you get surface smoothing from the snowfall in the mountains and if it's smoother there's less uh, friction, there's less shear, there's less turbulence, so all of these things are reduced and actually you see in the winter data that the efficiency of the turbines goes up. Also the atmosphere becomes more stable and you get some stratification. So this year, I actually came back yesterday from Gotthard as well, we have these measurements as well where we scan along the whole valley, along these green lines so we can actually see the whole winter and we have some measurements also on the turbines that we uh, can use. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. I'm calling Wolfgang Wicker from UNIL Atmospheric Processes and we're gonna switch the presentation here quickly. Also Wolfgang is a PhD student and uh, as Brandon both qualify for the, uh, for the awards. So Wolfgang, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a PhD student in Daniela's group, and I want particularly also to acknowledge Emanuele, a postdoc at ETH, who did uh, perform the model simulations that you will see today. So this is an image that I've taken from the WMO website on heat waves. I'm not super sure whether it's taken during a heat wave, but I think it conveys the image that most people have of climate change. Because the increase in intensity and frequency of heat waves is one of the most important consequences of climate change. So we set out to ask the question, is there a contribution by atmospheric dynamics to the increase in persistent temperature extremes? In other words, we want to know how can we attribute the change in heat wave frequencies to different atmospheric processes. I like to compare this task to a Taylor expansion. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have a change in heat wave frequency, and we try to decompose it into a contribution by thermodynamics, which is given as a product of the change in thermodynamics variables and a sensitivity of heat wave frequency to thermodynamics. The next part could be a contribution by the atmospheric circulation, again given by a circulation change in the sensitivity. One example for a contribution by thermodynamics for heat waves is related to soil moisture. During heat waves, we often observe a positive feedback between low soil moisture and high temperature. In a warmer climate, this uh, feedback becomes more effective and we have a contribution to the increase in heat wave frequency. 
An example for the contribution by the circulation is related to Arctic amplification. You will probably know that the Arctic warms two to four times faster than the global average, and that affects the jet stream. People often hypothesize that a warmer Arctic will produce a more wavy jet stream and hence increase the intensity of temperature extremes. For quantifying the contribution by the atmospheric circulation, we face two problems. First, we have to better estimate the circulation change. How will climate change the atmospheric circulation? And then we have to also answer how does heat wave frequency respond to a change in the atmospheric circulation? And that's what we're going to do today. In order to do so, we use a dry dynamical core experiment where we have no thermodynamic change, actually no thermodynamics at all. And uh, because the dry dynamical core is a part of an atmospheric model that solves the equations of motion. In particular, we use ICON in a Helsoare setup where we have a reference simulation given by the relaxation to, equilibrium, to an equilibrium temperature profile, which is plotted here on the top. So we have a Marilone temperature gradient. Then we have two sensitivity experiments that try to mimic the effect of sea ice loss in the Arctic, where we have surface intensified additional heating in the Arctic, or that mimic the effect of enhanced latent heat release in the tropical upper troposphere. And these two sensitivity experiments either reduce the lower tropospheric meridional temperature gradient, or they increase the upper tropospheric temperature gradient. These experiments have been designed by Butler et al. in 2010 and have been used to actually understand circulation change more profoundly, but we want to look at heat waves. So I define heat waves as a set of at least three consecutive days that exceeds the 90th percentile. And this is the zonal mean heat wave frequency for the reference simulation. We see that in the tropics and in the high latitudes, almost all hot days that are above the 90th percentile are part of a heat wave. In the mid latitudes, however, we see a deep minimum in heat wave frequency of where only about half of the hot days are form part of a heat wave. Now we have our two sensitivity experiments. We see that tropical heating moves this minimum poleward and makes it deeper, so there's less heat waves due to uh, the tropical heating. And the Arctic heating, or Arctic amplification, moves the minimum equatorward and makes it less deep. There's more heat waves in the mid-latitudes with Arctic heating. We want to explain this with eddy kinetic energy, uh, which is often used as a diagnostic for the mid-latitude storm check. So here in this plot, you see the zonal mean vertically integrated eddy kinetic energy as a function of latitude. In blue, you have the profile for the reference experiment. In green, you have the Arctic amplification case. And in, tro in, in orange, you have uh, the case of tropical heating. We see that for tropical heating, we have a poleward shift of the maximum, but the magnitude of maximum eddy kinetic energy is not really changed. For the Arctic amplification, we see an equatorward shift of eddy kinetic energy, and the magnitude is reduced. So we find it useful to summarize the circulation change in terms of magnitude and position of maximum eddy kinetic energy. Then we find it useful to summarize the change in heat wave frequency as the magnitude and the position of minimum heat wave frequency, the minimum that you've seen on the previous slide. Doing so, we can now plot these four quantities against each other and receive those scatter plots. The font size is a bit small, but I'll walk you through this. On the upper left, we have a, a scatter plot um, of uh, the position of the heat wave frequency minimum versus the position of the EKA maximum. And we find a very strong relationship where the 
position of heat wave frequency minimum is about eight degrees pole watt of the EKA maximum. We also look at the magnitude of EKA and maybe not surprisingly, there is no relationship between the position of the heat wave frequency minimum and the magnitude of EKE. If we look at the value of minimum heat wave frequency, we see a fairly strong negative relationship between the position of EKE maximum and minimum heat wave frequency. But again, we see no relationship between the magnitude of EKE and the magnitude of minimum heat wave frequency. The title here shows, a, of these subplots shows a coefficient of determination and the slope of the um, regression line. We find that uh, the relationship between position of the EKE maximum and the magnitude of minimum heat wave frequency is uh, as a uh, coefficient of determination above 50 percent. It increases quite a lot if we remove some outliers. So we see here we have an outlier for one experiment and here we have another outlier for one another experiment. Removing those uh, outliers we get a slope of a, a 2 percent heat wave frequency reduction per degree of Powert storm track shift. Yeah, that's the sensitivity that I've been talking about. Mid mini latitude minimum heat wave frequency reduces by 2% per degree of power storm track shift. Talking about a bit about the mechanism, uh, here we have plots of power spectra of meridional upper tropospheric wind um, in coordinates of zonal wave number on the y axis and phase speed on the x axis. And I often look at these spectra because, on the one hand side, phase speed can be used as a persistence measure, but on the other hand side, we have a good theoretical knowledge about what should determine phase speed. There's the Rossby wave dispersion relation. And if we now look at the response to Arctic or tropical heating, we find that Arctic heating reduces the phase speed and increases the zonal wave number, whereas tropical heating uh, reduces the zonal wave number, but increases the phase speed. So the mechanism that I don't have time to outline more in detail is a forward shifted storm track increases the phase speed, and phase speed increase reduces heat wave frequency. This is the relationship that we have also found from interannual and intraseasonal variability in reanalysis data set. In summary, we found that storm track latitude affects the persistence of temperature extreme. Now we have to think about what will the circulation change actually look like. We find that we have to consider both tropical heating and Arctic heating. And in the northern hemisphere, we still have to wait for a signal to emerge because there's this tug of war. In the southern hemisphere, however, we don't have Arctic amplification. We can already observe a significant pole world storm track shift. So I conclude that atmospheric dynamics contribute negatively to the increase in persistent temperature extremes. This is in contrast to a lot of literature uh, that, for example, use the geometry-based waviness metric to argue that there is increased heat wave frequency due to Arctic amplification, or literature that looks at the magnitude of eddy kinetic energy. And I have to say that probably, given the outliers that I discussed, this Sensitivity is not universal, but I think the conclusion is still relatively sound. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Then we're moving on Andries Jan de Vries. Same group, same institution. And uh, we're just switching here the presentation. All right. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Andries, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the group of Daniela Dolmeisen. This morning, I would like to share some of our research findings that aim to better understand the atmospheric processes leading to extreme weather in dry subtropical and cold polar regions. So we are particularly interested in heavy rainfall events in regions that are usually dry. Um, yeah, last week or earlier this week, we have seen the impacts of such events. Um, we had floodings in Spain leading to devastating impacts. 
And we're also interested in heat extremes in regions that are usually cold, in polar regions. So in this talk, I will mostly speak about heavy rainfall events in dry subtropical regions and only touch briefly upon heat extremes in polar regions. I would like to demonstrate the importance of such extreme events in dry subtropical and cold polar regions by focusing on the southern hemisphere, where early 2022 a number of notorious extreme weather events happened. Two flat episodes in eastern Australia in February and March led to devastating flood events, leading to dozens of fatalities and the most expensive natural disaster for the insurance industry in the history of Australia. In March, the same year, an unprecedented heat wave occurred in Antarctica that broke global temperature anomaly records. So temperatures reached almost 40 degrees above normal uh, for that time of the year. This event was also associated with the collapse of an ice shelf and coastal ice melt, as well as heavy rainfall over the interior of the Antarctic continent. And in April, another flood event affected southern Africa, leading to more than 500 fatalities and 3.5 billion US dollar in damage. And this event uh, was the most costly and the most deadly natural disaster in the history of South Africa. I will come back to these three events at the end of the talk. I will now focus on looking at weather systems that can lead to extreme weather events. Now, these have been studied since long. For example, extratropical cyclones have been related to heavy rainfall, mostly in mid-latitude regions. In the recent decade, atmospheric rivers received lots of attention. These are known as elongated and narrow filaments of strong atmospheric moisture transport, also associated with heavy rainfall, mostly in mid-latitude regions. Then moving to weather systems that are primarily associated with heavy rainfall in subtropical regions. We know about monsoon lows that lead to heavy rainfall in monsoon areas during the warm season. And occasionally these can also lead to the formation of so-called tropical cyclones. Now what these weather systems have in common is that they're primarily relevant for precipitation in humid regions. While we know much less about atmospheric processes leading to heavy rainfall in arid regions. Regarding heat extremes, these are mostly associated with anticyclones, whereas heat extremes in polar latitudes are also associated with extratropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers. Now, in our research, we're interested in a phenomenon that is known as the breaking of Rossby waves. Now, what are Rossby waves? These refer to meridional oscillations in upper tropospheric westerly winds and the jet stream, which owe their existence due to, due to the fact that the Earth is a rotating sphere. Now, occasionally, these Rossby waves can amplify in a meridional direction, leading to the overturning and the breaking of these waves, which leads to strong mixing of air masses from higher and lower latitudes. In the schematic you see here, um, this illustrates wave breaking in an equatorward direction of the jet stream. We can objectively identify wave breaking by the use of so-called potential vorticity streamers and cutoffs. So, uh, due to the time, we will not go much into detail. But PV streamers refer to the elongated structures in potential vorticity contours whereas cutoffs refer to isolated air masses with high or low PV values. Now, wave breaking can lead to extreme precipitation, which is here illustrated by a flood event that occurred with more than two decades ago in Algeria, leading to almost a thousand fatalities. In the blue colors, we see the vertical depth of the potential vorticity streamers and cutoffs and in the orange dot, the extreme precipitation occurring over the Mediterranean Sea and the north coast of North Africa. Now, there are various mechanisms as to how wave breaking can lead to extreme precipitation. It can induce a cyclonic circulation that affects moisture towards the region of extreme precipitation, whereas we can also expect quasi-geostrophic ascent at the downstream flank of the breaking waves, which is here illustrated by the gray solid contours denoting mid-tropospheric quasi-geostrophic ascent. 
in our study, we found that the number of devastating flood events in arid regions were linked to such wave breaking events, and we extended the analysis to a climatological study. In the colors, we see here the fractions of extreme precipitation occurrences that are associated with Rossby wave breaking. And these fractions reach up to 90% in different regions around the globe that have mostly an arid climate. So I don't have a pointer, but maybe from left to right, we see here the 90% the fractions occurring over the southwestern region in Central North America. Oh, thank you so much. That's helpful. And ah, yeah. So the, we see here the very high fractions over southwestern North America, central North America, the Mediterranean basin, and the adjacent North Africa coast, med the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. In the southern hemisphere, we find high fractions here over the Atacama and Patagonia regions, southern Africa, and then the southern flanks of Australia here. The crossed hatching shows regions where this relationship is significant, having a positive association, whereas the dots show a negative association, meaning that wave breaking actually reduces the chances of extreme precipitation occurrences, which implies that other weather systems are relevant for heavy rainfall in these regions. Now, the problem with significance testing is that it tells us whether the relationship is uh, significant or not, and whether it's positive or negative. But it does not tell us by how much wave breaking increases or reduces the occurrences of extreme rainfall. And for that reason, we introduced a measure that we gave the name extreme precipitation surplus, which quantifies by how much extreme precipitation increases or reduces the extreme rainfall occurrences. In blue colors, you see regions where wave breaking increases extreme precipitation occurrences, and in the yellow reddish colors, the regions where it actually reduces the occurrences of extreme precipitation. Now, this method became particularly handy when we want to do a spatial aggregation of the contribution of wave breaking to extreme precipitation which helped us to answer the question to what extent wave breaking contributes to heavy rainfall in regions with different degrees of aridity. We see here in the global map um, different climate zones ranging from a humid to hyper-arid climate by the bluish to red colors. We see here again the significance testing results overlaid showing that Wave breaking is important for extreme precipitation, primarily in the poleward and westward flank so of arid regions. We did do a spatial aggregation for the wave breaking contributions to extreme precipitation in the regions with different aridities. Here, starting with a humid climate for four different precipitation data sets. So we see here that the cross hatching shows the fractions of land surface area where there's a positive or a negative association, whereby the colors show the distribution of the extreme precipitation surplus. We extended this analysis going from a humid to a hyper arid climate, which shows that wave breaking becomes more important for extreme precipitation the more arid the climate is. So note that for the hyper arid climate, at least 80% or almost 80% of the land surface area has a positive association. Then I would like to come back uh, at this last slide of the results to the three extreme precipitation events in the Southern Hemisphere that we started with. It is not a big surprise that we found that the flood events in Australia and South Africa are associated with Rossby wave breaking in an equator direction of the mid-latitude storm track. One of the very interesting findings we found is that wave breaking in a polar direction of the mid-latitude storm track was associated with the Antarctic heat wave. Now, in this large collaborative effort, we looked at the atmospheric drivers of these three extreme weather events, reaching from the very local to planetary scales. And one of the key findings is that weather and climate variability in tropical 
regions, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the Medin Julian Oscillation, favored the formation of these extreme events by setting up large scale circulation patterns that favored the wave breaking over the regions of interest. So, to summarize, we have shown that wave breaking is a key driver of precipitation in arid regions. I will leave these three key points as they are. We also showed that wave breaking in a polar direction can lead to polar heat extremes. And in a follow up study, we show that this relationship is not only there for the Antarctic heat wave, but we found this linkage in a systematic climatological analysis for both Antarctica and the Arctic. More to come about that. With regards to precipitation in arid regions, this has large implications for both weather and climate prediction. So drylands host about one third of the world population that is disproportionately exposed to both flat hazards and freshwater shortages. And precisely in these regions, climate models project a strong precipitation decline, whereas the projections of extreme precipitation are highly uncertain. So this emphasizes the need to evaluate the representation of wave breaking climate model simulations to better understand the projected changes as well as uncertainties of hydrometeorological extremes in arid regions. And that is where I would like to end. Uh, thank you so much. Daniela Britomel for the next uh, talk. Daniela is a postdoc in cryos and recently at EMPA also. So hello everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Daniela and I'm going to present a work that I developed during my PhD at the Laboratory of Cryospheric Sciences at EPFL. Currently, as Hendrik said, I'm a postdoc at the Laboratory of Air Pollution and Environmental Technology at EMPA in Dubendorf, but I'm very happy uh, to be here today. So, uh, as the title suggests, I'm going to talk about snow transport and where do we stand regarding modeling it uh, in atmospheric models, and in particular, using the model named Cryowurf. Okay, so let me start, yeah, this is louder. Let me start by showing you what snow transport is. So snow transport occurs when the wind is strong enough to lift the snow particles uh, from the surface and it corresponds therefore to the transport of the snow particles by the wind. So uh, for example, in Antarctica, as you can see in this video, uh, the, the wind leads to the, this slow, this motion of, of particles close to the surface, um, and it leads to the formation of uh, uh, snow structures uh, at the surface, which are like dunes or rifles. So it changes the morphology uh, of the snow surface. And if the wind is even stronger, you can see that the snow particles can extend up to high regions uh, of the atmosphere, and this leads to the increase of snow sublimation, which is the phase change from the solids to the vapor state. And this will change the air temperature and moisture content in the lower atmosphere. So how do we model all this complexity? So the first uh, point is to conceptualize snow transport in two modes, uh, saltation and suspension. So saltation is this motion of snow particles close to the surface that you saw in the first mo video. So this shallow layer of moving grains that you saw are actually particles in saltation and we call it the saltation layer. Then uh, up to high regions of the atmosphere, we have particles in suspension, which are in general smaller than those uh, in saltation and are mainly advected uh, by the flow. And this is what you saw in the second video. Then we need to model these two modes of transport uh, somehow. And in atmospheric uh, models, snow saltation is a subgrid scale uh, process, and therefore it is parameterized. While snow suspension is, oh, sorry, I forgot to say that, <laughs> that from the parameterizations, we end up with the concentration and number of snow particles at the top of the saltation layer which will serve as a low boundary condition for the particles in suspension, which are modeled in an Eulerian way with advection uh, diffusion type equations. And this is exactly the structure uh, used in Cryowurf to uh, model snow transport. And Cryowurf is uh, the coupling of the weather research and forecasting model WORF with the snow model snowpack. 
Snowpack is a multi-layer uh, snow model which describes the stratigraphy of the snow cover uh, at different points in space and its time evolution according to the heat, flux heat fluxes at the surface and the occurrence of precipitation. So in order to assess how Cryowerf was able to model snow transport, we have performed a one-year simulation around uh, the, the French station de Mondorville, uh, and we used uh, two uh, domains, uh, one parent domain of, with nine kilometers resolution and another domain of three, of three kilometers resolution. And we chose this location because it, uh, like it included the uh, station D17, uh, where continuous measurements of snow transport uh, were available. And uh, in particular, we had wind speed sensors at different heights, and the snow uh, particles mass flux was measured with two acoustic uh, flow cap sensors, which are basically uh, long tubes, like one meter long tubes, which are placed one uh, on top of the other. So to compare the observations with the model, we integrated the modeled mass flux along the first meter height, which was comparable with the lower tube, and along from the, the one meter height to two meters height to compare with the second tube. So uh, here you have the results, and I'm going to show only the results from November 2014 and July 2015, just uh, that as, as an example of the, the winter and, and, and summer seasons in the southern hemisphere. And uh, in the lower panels, you have the, um, the mass flux obtained over the lower flow cap sensor, and in the middle one over the upper flow cap sensor, and on the top, you have the two meters wind speed. So the observations are in black, and uh, the simulated values are in pink, and the blue bars represent the occurrence of precipitation. So first, uh, if you look uh, at the different differences in the y-axis, it's clear that the frequency and intensity of snow transport are higher during the austral uh, winter months. Uh, so you can see, uh, and this is like for example for the month of, of July, that you can see that the intensity and frequency of snow transport is much higher, and this is in agreement with the higher wind speeds that we get, that you can see on the top panel. If we look first at the month of November, and specifically in the first, fifth, like the first half of the month, you can see that the model predicts in a reasonable way the, the trends obtained, uh, obtained with the observations. Uh, however, if you look at the second half of the month, you can see that the model fails to predict the occurrence uh, of snow transport. If we now move to the month of July, you can see in the middle panel uh, that we uh, underestimate the mass flux uh, of, uh, of particles uh, being transported by the wind. And in the lower panel, you see that the model actually overestimates uh, significantly the mass flux uh, in the lower, uh, along the lower tube. And this was actually good news for me because I knew that there was a problem uh, in the model. So I spent the first three years of my PhD zooming in into the saltation layer and seeing in detail, uh, studying in detail the motion of snow particles and uh, how its physical laws and how this was modeled in both small scale and large scale. And um, from this, this detailed analysis, we found three caveats uh, in the way uh, snow saltation was implemented uh, in the model. So first we found inconsistent uh, parameterizations. Uh, then we found that there was, uh, that the, the horizontal particle velocity was not correctly uh, modeled. So there was a scaling uh, problem in the way that we, we were uh, computing the, the, the particle velocity. And finally, uh, the lower uh, boundary for the advection diffusion equations was actually specified outside of the region of validity for these equations. So taking into account these issues, we proposed three changes in the parameterizations. So one regarding the equation used for the particle velocity, and then we decided for a fixed height for the lower boundary, and we changed the particle size distribution so that it was in agreement with this new height that we, that we specified. 
So then we performed now simulations for the month of July with this new set of parameterizations, <coughs> and the new results are presented in blue. And you can see uh, that on the one hand, we got still the same underestimation above uh, on, the t on the upper uh, flow cap sensor, but if you look at the lower flow cap sensor, you can see that we managed to resolve most of this overestimation uh, that we got. And here I show you the month of July, but if, there w if I would show you other months, this was even more significant, this overestimation that we managed to solve by changing these parameterizations. So in conclusion, I want, you to, I want to, to highlight again that snow transport is an important process in snow-covered regions, and it is re of relevance for uh, snow surface mass balance and other feedbacks with the atmosphere, and the better we understand the processes in this region, the better we can uh, make our predictions of the impact of climate change. Uh, then uh, cryoworth simulations were performed, and uh, the simulation results were compared with flow cap measurements, and uh, the, this comparison showed between other things an overestimation during the austral winter months. And based on a detailed analysis of snow saltation, new parameterizations were proposed, which are uh, more agreement, uh, improved the agreement between the simulations and the measurements. And this issue on the parameterizations was not restricted to cryoworth. You can also find it in other atmospheric models as RACMO and MAR. Uh, and of course, for the developments are still needed. For instance, regarding the parameters that we use on the advection diffusion equations, that probably would help us um, solve this underestimation that we see there. And of course, we need to add some error bars in the observations. We need to study uh, the assess, assess a bit the uncertainty of the flow cap measurements. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to take this uh, occasion to thank all the speakers for, uh, I think, four excellent talks. I also apologize for going a little bit into the break, but I think it was interesting <coughs> enough with the questions and discussion to sacrifice a, a couple of minutes of the break for this. We're now having uh, a coffee break and uh, we are resuming at 10.30. So exactly, posters are also outside, drinks are outside. Thank you for your attention and for your questions and the discussion and see you in a bit later. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our Hi. keynote speaker, Andreas Prein, who came all the way from Zurich for the event. Thank you, Andreas. Um, he's just been hired as a full professor of high resolution weather and climate modeling at the Institute for Atmospheric and Climate Science of um, the ETH Zurich. He earned his bachelor, master's, and PhD degrees from uh, Karl Franzens University in Graz in Austria, where he started off with uh, high resolution regional modeling in the Alpine region. And then he went on to NCAR in Boulder, Colorado, where he really extended his research to high resolution modeling all around the world. And um, a lot of his research aims to um, deepen our understanding of how climate change impacts extreme weather with a lot of focus on mesoscale, so 100 kilometer uh, scale processes in the atmosphere and also how uh, these extreme events interact with other components of the Earth system. So Andreas, welcome. Thank you so much for accepting your invitation and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, and thanks for, for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here and learn more about your interesting research. Like The first session was already mind-blowing, so I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Um, so my research is really focusing on this interface between weather and climate, and I'm mostly interested in extreme events, but also to the processes that lead to extreme events and how to simulate those in numerical models. Um, so I, I wanted to show you these two images, start off with that to motivate why this is important. Uh, this is actually in Lausanne, don't ask me which corner this is. This is 1955, they, they had a basically press release because they installed um, a traffic light. And <laughs> here, here we go, 
the traffic light, like there's a new traffic light, they updated the traffic light. But the reason why I'm showing you this is that many things have changed. The sewer is still there. It's the same sewer that was in 1955. It's still, it's still there today. I wasn't there, but I'm pretty sure and confident to say that. So the point here is really our infrastructure that we have in our cities, but all over our countries, that keeps us safe for flooding, for example, the dams that we have, the electric system, they have very long lifetimes. So designing those systems to withstand extreme events is really important. So this is approximately the estimate of the 100-year flood event in Lausanne. It's 195 millimeters per day. And of course, with climate change, we know that um, this value will change. However, like this is a challenge how to adapt to, to this changing. So what you see here, and all of you probably know that, the last 10 years were the 10 warmest years on record globally. So we are already very close to 1.5 degrees. We have a quite significant warming already behind us. This value that we see here is definitely not valid anymore. Um, and will continue to change into the future, but the, the infrastructure is still there and will still be there probably in the future. Um, so just a rule of thumb, if you warm up the atmosphere, Klaus is clapperone, if you add three degrees, let's say we have a three degree warming, uh, you get approximately 50 millimeters more precipitation or 40 millimeters more precipitation. So you increase this value to 235 millimeters per day. This would be now a 300 year event in the current climate conditions. Or you can see at the other side of around where you say the 100 year event in nowadays is the 20 year event in a three degree climate, uh, so approximately. One of the, the big issues, of course, like this data is coming from observations. And our observational record is quite short. So this is what you see here. This is this graphics and all these numbers come from Meteor Swiss. Uh, the station that is used here, this is actually near Lausanne, um, is from 1961 to 2010. So these are approximately 50 years of data. Now we estimate the 100 year event and out here the 200, some people estimate the 1000 return value. And basically what you can see here, the blue line is the best estimate. These are the numbers that I give you here. So nine, 195 is basically where the red line crosses the blue, but there's a massive spread. So the, the spread in current day uncertainty in the 100 year event is 90, uh, 148 to 275 millimeters. So it's actually bigger than the climate change signal that we add. So this is a, a massive problem. Um, not, it's not only climate change that, that amplifies extremes, but also we cannot really quantify what extremes mean in the current climate condition. And I think high resolution modeling is really a way that we can reduce these uncertainties and learn more about our risks in current climate, past climate, and future climate. So I brought this, uh, this precipitation maps with me. These are showing you the daily accumulated rainfall. I could have brought other extreme events. There are a couple, like many of those examples nowadays, unfortunately. But this is from the West Virginia flooding. So I have a couple of US examples uh, lived in the US for the last 10 years. This was a one in a 500 year event, approximately, one of the deadliest flash floods that we had since Katrina in the US. And I wanted you to guess which of these maps uh, is from the observations and what the, 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 this was actually forecast with high resolution models, ensemble forecasts uh, are giving you. And you don't have to answer, like it's not that important. The, the key point here is it's really difficult to, to differentiate. Uh, the top left is the observations actually. But then you can see the model has similar amplitudes. And this is actually a one in the 500 year event that, that the model has never seen such a storm in this region and still can give you a quite accurate number of how high the accumulation might be and how big the area might be. But what you can also see is that gives you a larger variety of storms that might have happened. So it's not only that you can get some members, forecast members that are quite accurate, but you can also see, for example, the lower left one, the one kilometer simulation has a, a much bigger storm, so this might have had happened. Uh, or the next one to the right to it has a much weaker system. So again, you could use this information uh, if you have a well calibrated model to say to, to, to uh, improve your design values, for example, and risk assessments uh, with this high resolution modeling. So let's do another one. This is uh, Tropical Storm Build 20. 15 in June, and again, you can guess which one is the observations and which one is the model. 
And that, that's actually a trick question because all of them are observations. <laughs> so what's happening here is um, if you only have station data, and this is for most of the world, we don't have radar, you get something that's similar to the lower left. And actually, if you look at this figure, you can actually see the individual dots where you have precipitation stations in this field. Once you have radar data and you simulate that in, in addition to your rainfall gauges, you get anything else. And those are really not independent data sets. They have the same radar stations in there. They have the same gauges in there. And you can still see locally there are massive differences. I don't know if I can, yeah. So if you, for example, just look at the coastline, this prison data set has way less precipitation than, for example, MRMS, which is probably the gold standard that we have in the US. Same is true for any regions in the, in the world. Like the US is really one of the best observational networks. Switzerland is pretty good as well. You will find similar sensitivities. So again, it's very hard to actually differentiate in such a situation if the model has systematic biases for extreme events, which is maybe a good thing because you can say you can use model simulations to as close to observational truth if you have, again, if you have very well calibrated models. And this is just a movie to show you how this would look like if you look at the cloud field. This is a simulation we finished uh, two years ago. This is downscaling ERA-5 reanalysis, for those of you who know that data set, over the North American continent to four kilometers with the weather research and forecasting model. I'm happy that you introduced the model before me. Um, and you can compare the cloud field to geo -sat satellite. And we actually now have 40 years of this data um, available for research in current climate and future climate. And you can see, like, we, we use spectral nudging. That's why it's so similar. But the cloud field looks very, very similar. Not only the cloud field, we can also do statistics on that. So where the maps on the lower left don't work, uh, this should be the US uh, with some sub-regions. But this is basically focused on the northeast uh, regions of the US. Comparing uh, station networks, this is hourly rainfall probability density functions in black. Then we have this CONUS 44, these are the WOLF simulations in red. And then we have a stage four, which is uh, a radar based four kilometer hourly data set. So it's a really good precipitation data set. And what you can see, this, this simulations can fit the PDF of observed rainfall extremely well in this region. But it's not only the northeast, it's also the southeast, very different meteorology down there. You get hurricanes, you get much more convective activity down there. And still, you can see that the simulations are actually closer to, to the station data than the uh, radar data in this region. Same, same is true for the Prairie region. Again, very different climate, much more continental, very large organized storms, something that we have seen on my title slide, this rapidly developing mesoscale convective systems and even very arid regions, the Great Basin, where actually the, the observations, the radar data has big issues because there's beam blocking and you get lot, lots of artifacts that are unreal. The blue line is way too high, has way too high precipitation um, in there. The model is doing a pretty good job. So you can argue WOLF is developed in North America. It's very well tuned, and I already talked about it. You need a very well calibrated model uh, to trust the model as well. Um, so what we try to do is we try to trust, uh, st stress test our modeling system. We put the whole, like the same modeling system over, uh, over South America, did the same experiment, very similar setup. And this is what we get, for example. Like this is, again, a PDF. And now we can see we downscaled ERA-5, which is the blue. Then we have GPM iMERGE, which is, which is a satellite-based um, precipitation data set globally, also hourly precipitation. And then we have two versions of WOLF at 24 kilometers and 4 kilometers. Now it looks like WOLF is doing really bad. Like WOLF has, is way out there with extreme rainfall uh, if you compare to the observational data sets. But the clue here is... It's not like there's not a lot of observations in South America station observations, but there are some. And this is the network that we used here uh, to compare. And if you add this to this plot, this is the black line. You can clearly see what, which, and what, which of these data sets is, is closest to the observations. So Wolf overestimates the extreme rain, rainfall rates, but it's much closer to hourly rainfall than what you would get from ERA-5 or the satellite data. So just the... Maybe a warning, don't trust those data sets blindly, especially at high resolution. Um, but then also nice to see that the WOLF system, even in the region, a uh, very tropical region, is still able to produce, reproduce extreme rainfall rates um, compared to station observations. 
since we have a 40 year data set, now you can also look at climate change trends. Like this is this four kilometer, four, ki four kilometer, 40 year downscale data sets. And we're looking at the, the changes in extreme rainfall. This is the annual hourly extreme. Uh, comparing the observations on top, these are station values, everything that's dark blue and in circles, it's statistically significant to the model simulations at these points where we have observations. And the key point that I wanted to make here is, first of all, what we see systematically is that dry hours are increasing in frequency. These are the first bars here. So it's basically the duration between precipitation events is getting longer. And this is exactly what we also want, uh, expecting from climate change. And then depending on how heavy the rainfall is that you're looking at, uh, if it's light, moderate, heavy, or extreme, the increase is getting stronger and stronger. So the, the, the heaviest rainfall events are in increasing in frequency the fastest, which is really bad news. There are a couple of studies that show that. And the model and the observations agree quite well, although I have to say, like, if you look at this, the model is systematically underestimating the trends that we see in observations, and this is quite concerning. Uh, we see this in a couple of studies that the, the models, even high-resolution models, are not keeping up with the changes that we see in observations. So the, the, the question, of course, then is um, if the, the future projections that we see are also too conservative. So I talked a lot about rainfall. Of course, if you do dynamical downscaling with these models um, or just high-resolution modeling, you get lots of other fields that you can look at as well. I just quickly wanted to show you 10-meter 10 meter, 10 meter wind, wind speed and starting this animation. I really like this. This is showing you nice fluid dynamics, uh, lots of different things that you can look at. What I quickly pause here, what you can see, for example, uh, since we, we use ERA-5, this is the driving data, you can see that the large-scale wind field is very similar between the two. And this is what on purpose, because we use this spectral nudging approach where we don't allow the model to drift, the four kilometer model to drift too far. Secondly, what you can also see, and let's see if I can find that. Um, you can also see very nice topographic effects. Like for example here, you can see vortex shedding in the lee of this small island. Uh, the island is not there in, in Euro 5, it's too coarse. But in Wolf, we can simulate the island and you get nice flow patterns that we actually observe in nature as well. Also, you can clearly see that something is very different in, in the complex topography region. So if you compare this field here to this field, like you get very different wind, wind fields in, in areas where you have complex topography just because you resolve the, the mountains much better. But the first thing, when I looked this, at this video and that motivated to write this paper that's noted down there is basically, and let me see if I can find this now, it's features like this one which is completely missing in era five. And these are copal driven, convective driven extreme wind, wind events. So these massive storms, these massive scale convective systems have very strong winds associated with them at the surface. And they are, this is basically what you can see here, they have large scale winds that can travel across very large distances. So you can see it's still going over here, hours later, crossing different states. And those winds are actually the, the winds that are dominating ex the extreme wind field in summertime in the US. So they can cause a lot of damage. And this is, this is a figure that you, I guess we will not be able to observe the wind field in this resolution in my lifetime. So this is basically when you look at the four kilometer maximum 20 second wind speed within the month of August 2019. So this is just the, the maximum wind speed that the model uh, simulated. And what you can see here are the this, this streaks. Um, these are exactly these this thunderstorms that travel with the, with the flow and cause this very high wind extreme. So it's similar if you look at the same figure, extreme rainfall, you would also see streaks because it's the thunderstorms that cause these very extreme wind speeds. You can see, like, it can do this for 40 years now, which is quite nice to look at. Well, another thing I wanted to highlight, this is a tropical cyclone, just if you wonder what this blob down here is, you can see the rotation in it. And on the right hand side, you can see how this looks like over 40 years. And now you can really start to look at statistics, for example, of um, thunderstorm gusts. But still, even 40 years of data, you can still, uh, still see there's lots of noise in these fields as well. Yeah, this is the paper that, that came out of this study. 
so the, the point here is really once you go to this kilometer scales, uh, there's really a regime shift of how you resolve specifically convection. This is just shown here in idealized simulations with uh, the precipitation field. Once you get this very, very localized extreme pockets of rainfall, and even if you increase resolution further, like those are more similar to the high resolution simulations at four kilometers than, for example, what you would get at 12 kilometers. However, of course, this is not perfect. Like I would never claim that a kilometer simulation does everything great. For example, we heard about wind speed and turbines in alpine regions. I would be very cautious uh, of the wind in these locations at four kilometer grid spacing. You will be quite far off. Um, so this is another thing that, that I'm interested in in my group as well. So how much can we trust these models, these kilometer scale models? Because these are the models we can afford to run over quite long time periods. And how can we improve them? And one way to do this is to look at higher version, like higher resolution versions of these models. And this is, for example, what we did in this, this project with um, the um, Department of Energy in the US. They have very nice facilities in the atmospheric system research area of this department where they deploy a lot of instruments. This is, for example, the, the, the Southern Great Plain site that they have. They operate this site since, since 30 years. So it's a really long, nice data set that you can use here. And we looked at mesoscale convective systems, which are these big storm systems that you can see here as they move over this site. And this is um, a simulation of one of these systems at 125 meters. And just like this is a zoom in, you can see it again, very nice cloud stretches. And that's actually not the, the real resolution of the data. You can zoom in three times more to see that like this is a really, this was a very expensive simulation to do. Um, but what you can do with these kind of simulations is then of course you simulate the same cloud, uh, the same system at different grid spacings. And this is the same system at four kilometers and 12 kilometers. And kind of like you can see the 12 kilometer and the four kilometer kind of really want to do the same thing. Like you can still see the same structures. And that's mostly because there was a large scale forcing included here. So there's some support from the large scale to, to organize the storm. But of course you lose all these nice turbulent structures that you need also for the cloud dynamics, entrainment of, of, of dry air and mid levels, for example, and so on. So the question now is which grid spacing is really sufficient? And this is definitely depending on your research question. So not all research questions will, not everything will be doable at four kilometers. The main point that I wanted to make here is just the cost item here. Like if you run this storm system at 125 meters on a computer, you can run for the same computational cost, you can run 30,000 times cheaper at four kilometers. I think I calculated, I have this on my notes, but I think this is 80 years of simulations uh, instead of one day. And like, again, like you can do a, a million times cheaper if you go to 12 kilometers. So some, some of the most expensive things that, that you can do in your name list if you run models is to increase the grid spacing. <laughs> Um, so knowing what you can do or what is the limit, the, 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 the grid spacing that you really need for your research question is really important. So we, again, like we looked at these different storms uh, across different scales. And now at the beginning, I showed you how nice four kilometer looks if you compare it to satellite data, for example. Now, now you can see how poor four kilometer looks if you compare it to large eddy simulations. So now you, this is the up, updrafts in this storm how fast air is moving vertically and also um, downward and upward. You can clearly see this very turbulent structure here. And here you have a couple of boxes. A 12 kilometer gives you nothing. It's, it's basically very weak um, vertical motion. What you can do in this study, which was nice, since we do this over this arm side, you have observations. So there's a vertically pointing radar uh, data. And it's similar to the LIDAR that we saw in the first talk where wind speed was estimated. Now you can basically estimate vertical wind speeds because of the, the uh, vertically pointing radar and you get the reflectivity from the data, uh, from the radar system and you can estimate in the cloud how fast particles move up and down. So you can compare this and this is actually now a, a height time plot because you're sitting at the same location and you see the, the system moving over you. So we outputted the same data time height in the observations at least in the 500, 250 and 200, uh, 125 meter simulations. And if you look at statistics then, for example, so if you, for example, look at the maximum speed of updrafts compared to the, the width of the updraft. So the, the, the wider, the, the larger the updraft is, the more 
Uh, the stronger the vertical motion typically is in the middle. And you can see this very clearly on the observations with just the, uh, the dark, um, the, the black line. And you can see like even at 250 meters, which is the light red line, you, you heavily underestimate the peak updrafts. And you kind of see like that the 125 meters gets closer, but we only were able to afford two simulations. So we couldn't really extend out to um, higher extreme or stronger um, updrafts because we didn't have the sample size. But even there you struggle, like even with 100 meters. But again, like is, is this really uh, necessary? So if, if you're really more interested in the climate change perspective, perspective or you want to make and ensure that if you have such a big storm system, it should precipitate approximately the right amount and it should release approximately the, the right amount of heat in the, in the right levels. This is probably, if you look at the climate perspective, what you're interested in, and this is basically what we try to, to look at here. This is called bulk convergence. So if you look at the whole system and does the whole system do something meaningful, and actually four kilometers is pretty close to 250 meters if you do that. So what you see here, uh, the, the solid lines are for storms in um, the southern Great Plains, so the mid-latitude mid storms. And then we had another site in the tropics in the Amazon. And these are the, the dashed lines. You can see very different heating profiles uh, depending like top heavy heating in the mid-latitudes. That this is what we know, much more bottom heating in, in the tropics. And actually 250 meters and the four kilometers give you some very similar answers here, which is interesting to see. Um, also vertical mass transport. So we have some biases in where the peak occurs, but overall the mass where like how much mass you transport is quite similar. So again, it really depends on what you're interested in and what question you're interested in. But overall, like kilometer scale models can give you quite a lot of information, especially if you think about a climate change perspective and are definitely very useful tools. So I think we, we are living in a very interesting time um, because computational advantages really allow us to do simulations at scales that we, I haven't dreamed of a couple of years ago. Like in, in Switzerland, for example, ALP, the ALP system at CSCS was inaugurated a couple of weeks ago. This is now the sixth biggest supercomputer on the planet. It's the biggest computer in Europe. Uh, the, it's the, the, the most advanced chip technology in there. In the ETH, we have an associated um, model development framework, which is called Exclaim, where we port the ICON um, model to run on GPUs specifically on this system efficiently. So combining those two, now you can really do amazing simulations at scales um, that, that are changing our way that we can address climate change and weather changes. And I think I could definitely say this is the dawn of kilometer scale global climate simulations. So we, we are already in this era. These are nice animations. This is now with the MPAS models, just to show you this was a 3.75 kilometer grid spacing global simulation. And if I maybe, I, can't, I don't know if I can go back, but you can, for example, see the Amazon, the, the footprint of the Amazon rainfall and cooling of the water in the Amazon in the two meter temperature field. So you can get massive details. You can also see cold pools spreading out. It's, it's amazing to look at these emanations and they will be able to, to tell us a lot about our atmosphere. And I think this, these are, will be great tools to learn more about weather and climate change combined. And um, the, the things that we will be able to do with this new system, with this new supercomputer, but also with the new modeling version, for example, will be this high resolution global simulations over multiple years, maybe even transient simulations. And we, we're working on a coupled model version that hopefully will be available soon next year. Mm -hmm. Additionally, of course, you can, I think, continuing to, to do regional modeling would be really interesting, but still, instead of doing one decade or four decades, now you can think about or dream about ensemble-based regional models at kilometer scales. Imagine what you can do with that. Like, this would be really a game changer of how we can address local scale climate change, especially for extremes and how we adapt to, to extreme events. And then of course, you can also go push the boundaries at LES scale modeling and do, for example, month-long or year-long LES simulations over the Alpine region. Um, again, like there are so many applications. I just think about the first session here. Um, I think that there's so many applications you can use these models for. And this is just a couple of research questions. So uh, scale interactions in the atmosphere come to mind, of course. Um, 
or just providing kilometer scale climate information at global scales for underserved communities. Um, here in the middle, for uh, especially like rare events, how are those changing, differentiating between local or internal climate variability and forced climate change and local scales, something that we have never been able to, to do before. And of course, at the, the LES scale modeling, not only for very localized uh, questions, but also to, to help us to, be, to improve the course resolution simulations. So those are really, I think, in my mind, they're fitting together. They are, there's a commonality in here. So these, these simulations will help us to, to gain more understanding on different scales, but they also will help us to further develop in mo the modeling system as a whole. What I want to shout out here is, I think this is a great time to get discussions going. So we, we are sure that we will run simulations like that soon. I think it, it, we really have to do this as a, as a community. If we spend this, this amount of, of resources, we should take advantage of those and try to make the simulations as usable as possible. Um, also to share the data early on. So just to, to summarize my talk, uh, modern day kilometer scale simulations can reach close to observational quality if you have well calibrated um, simulations, uh, as, as, like, at least for some applications for extreme as, uh, precipitation, for example. This is the example that I gave you. However, of course, these models are not perfect and there's still lots of biases, um, shallow convection, for example, entrainment into clouds, um, local scale winds um, are not really well simulated on kilometer scales. Uh, but of course, like as I said, like this modern day HPC systems will push the boundaries and let us do things that we probably haven't dreamed of before. And uh, designing these data sets as a community, I think, is, is the way to go here. And the way, like one example that I wanted to show you where we tried to do this is the South American simulations uh, that we released last year. These are four kilometer wolf simulations over 20 years. And that's just a beautiful animation of the cloud field that comes out of these animations. And I hope there is still some time for questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, it just, uh, I mean, it, it just to perhaps uh, say one word about uh, this session. So, Lukas Schmutz, unfortunately, is uh, sick and he will be last minute replaced by Michel Lenning, who kindly agreed to give the second talk. Uh, and now we are glad to have uh, Tom Buechler, who is uh, professor in, uh, in environmental data science at UNIL. Uh, so, Tom, please. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, Okay, wonderful. So I'm, um, I'm Tom Buechler, and I lead a group at the University of Lausanne exploring the intersection of atmospheric physics and machine learning. And a question I very often get is, have we learned anything new um, using machine learning? You know, is it just a trend? And that motivated a two years, uh, almost three year study now with this incredible team of early uh, career scientists. Uh, and I'm really grateful for this team. I learned so much. Um, and the reason I think we get this question so much is that usually when machine learning algorithms are trained for atmospheric application, and if you're not familiar with machine learning, just think of them as very, very powerful, flexible tools for regression uh, that can approximate nonlinear uh, relationships, even for high dimensional system, is that we can see that these uh, machine learning based models are working. We can measure how much they decrease the error, but they're really hard to understand. And I think the current revolution in numerical weather prediction is a good example. This is the encoding part of uh, the foundation model that was just put out by Microsoft, Aurora. It's really impressive. It doesn't just do high resolution weather forecasting. It also gives a global atmospheric pollution forecast five day ahead. And you know it does all these things using a variety of data sources, but if I give you the model, it's pretty intimidating. You would never know exactly which part of the model makes it work so well. Um, and so the question that I'm gonna be uh, asking is, how can we discover, clearly these models are decreasing the error, so they're doing something. Uh, if they trained well, they're not cheating. So can we systematically understand the scientific knowledge they brought us? Why are they performing better? Uh, and for that, inspired by climate model hierarchies, because climate models also started becoming a lot more complex in the 90s, and people started dissecting them, um, 
What we proposed in this study, we just submitted it this summer, is to organize all the different machine learning models we develop in a well-defined complexity performance plane. So imagine you train a bunch of models for a task, and then you sort them. On the y-axis, you uh, show how much error they make. On the x-axis, you show how complex they are. There are all kinds of ways of defining how complex models are. Uh, you could, for example, just think of the number of trainable parameters they have. And then what's the best model? It's kind of hard to tell, but what you know is you usually want models to be simpler and produce lower error. So we're aiming for that lower left corner. And what we can do when we have multiple criteria is use Pareto optimization. And a Pareto front gives you all the models that are optimal in the sense that you can't move away from that frontier without having to trade off either error or complexity. And so in practice, all we do is we draw a staircase to show how close we are to the lower left corner. And so all the models here on that staircase are Pareto optimal. And then what does machine learning does? Usually, especially when we train neural networks, they're very complex model. And what's easy is to use a really big, flexible model, train it on a new cool data set, like the kind of ones Andreas was showing us earlier, right? We know there's going to be new information in them. And then we reduce error. So we're going down, but we're not going left. And so then what I'm really interested in, uh, and that's a lot of my group's work, is, OK, can we now make that added value simpler so that we can understand it and explain it to humans? Um, and in that paper, we propose as many ways of category, uh, categorizing knowledge. It gets ph philosophical very quickly. But at least for atmospheric applications, uh, a lot of what we gain through machine learning can be sorted into learning a better function, so nonlinearity or stochasticity that wasn't there before, using new information, new features, variables that we weren't able to use before, disco discovering connectivities in space and or time. And so once we do that, that's a process that we call distillation, we can go closer to the left and get a simpler model that has some of this new knowledge that we can explain to other humans. And then we uh, can hope that we gain some new knowledge about the system we're trying to model. Uh, and so I'm going to give you, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to give you a bird eyes view of that study. Uh, I'll put the reference at the end if you're interested in the details. We cover three very diverse examples on realistic data sets and uh, relevant for climate uh, or weather predictions. So we first uh, cover cloud cover parameterization. Then we give the example of shortwave radiative transfer emulation that's mostly been used in the weather context. Uh, parameterization are really useful in a climate context, and then uh, better understanding the physics behind how storms produce uh, tropical precipitation. So example one, so I'm going to go through all three examples, I'm going to zoom through, and then you can look at the paper if you want more example. I'll try to give you the general philosophy of what we're trying to do. So for cloud cover parameterization, what the problem is that for a given emiss emission scenario, most of our uncertainty when we project the climate long term comes from uh, how um, uncertainties in how we uh, model clouds and storms. And as Andreas showed, when you increase the resolution, you can represent these processes better uh, until, as he said, the, all the rain comes from the macrophysics and we have much more certainty. Um, but these models are really, really costly. We can't really run ensembles of them from long-term climate projections. But what machine learning can do is it can learn to mimic their behavior, and then you can use them as in parameterization, as parameterizations as in coarser models that are much cheaper to run. And so you can basically get some of the benefits of the high resolution and then recycle them for models that are much cheaper to run. So here we're learning from uh, Diamond, which is an intercomparison experiment of global storm resolving models, similar to what Andreas showed earlier. So what we do is we have an original cloud cover. It's very high resolution, so we can just say it's zero when cloud condensates are below a threshold, uh, typically 10 to the minus um, 5 kilogram per kilogram, and then it's one when there's a cloud. And then what we say is, okay, what would the cloud cover look like from the perspective of the coarse model? So we coarse grain it. And then we want to learn a relationship between the environment and that cloud cover that's in the coarse model but has a lot of the benefits of the high-resolution models. 
And so here we are, back to the plane. So we're trying to aim for the lower left corner. These are the existing models. I, um, here you can see the model, the cloud cover parameterization that was currently in Icon. It's not very good. It was developed a while back. In the 90s, it wasn't so bad, sunk this, but now like even simple linear models can beat it with the data that we have. Um, and then what we can do is we can train neural networks. So that's from a study uh, led by the DLR. I was part of it. And a neural network does a really good job at estimating this high fidelity cloud cover. So here we go. We went down with a neural network, with deep learning, we're happy. But then what have we learned? You can't just throw this giant neural network and tell people, OK, we've learned something. And so that's uh, been, um, we use this Pareto um, optimal model hierarchy to distill the added value of the network so it was able to learn from features we didn't quite use before, like um, vertical gradients and relative humidity, and we distill it into a simple equation. And so we do equation discovery, and in the paper, we show how with just three terms, we learn um, an 11 parameter model that performs almost as well as a neural network and bonus, each of these uh, terms can be interpreted. The first one is basically just a Taylor expansion uh, in relative humidity and temperature. So that's a thermodynamic effect that we understand quite well. The second one is able to uh, capture the effect of the low clouds that are uh, the source of so much of our uncertainty using this relative humidity gradient. And the third one has a little surprise for us. It uses ice and liquid to uh, output cloud cover. And what was really unexpected in that case is that we didn't get the same coefficient for cloud or liquid, which is counterintuitive. Because when we had high resolution, we count one, whether it's a liquid or a cloud, it doesn't matter. But then if you look at how liquid and cloud are distributed at high resolution, they don't really distribute in the same way. And the distribution at high resolution of uh, Liquid water is smoother, I mean, has um, decreases less fast than that of ice. So you can think of ice as um, more anvil clouds, and so they spread a much wider area with uh, lower values. And so when you know you have a bit of ice on average in your grid, you should crank up the cloud cover. And that's typically the kind of thing that if you just did it empirically, you wouldn't necessarily think of it. But if you, make, uh, if you systematically use uh, machine learning tools and then extract this knowledge, oh my god, just one minute. OK, yeah, there's no way I go through, I'm going through the three examples. Um, but that's a good example to finish on. Because like in that case, we learned something new and unexpected. And of course, I put way too many slides. Um, we go through um, also the shortwave radiative transfer example for meteorology, and in that case, okay, I'm gonna spoil everything, and uh, <laughs> clearly I haven't had time to practice this. Um, the best architecture we get mimics the two-stream radiative transfer equation, so we're really happy, and that's a bit fancy, but when you look at certain architectures, they make certain hypotheses that may reflect the physical system. So that reflects the fact that when we model radiation, often if we just have one stream going down and one stream going up, and we update it using a sequence, that's enough to model most of the radiative transfer. So by knowing which architecture to use, you can guess the original form of the equation. In that case, we know the answer, so it's easier, but in more general cases, you could think of learning new laws and new number of features you need to represent systems. The last example um, is comparing how much information you get from increasing the spatial resolution compared to using more time steps in the past and using memory. And what's really interesting from an information theory perspective is that by going back in time, you get some of the information you lost when you went to a coarser model. So even when you don't have the power or the compute resources to run a really high resolution model, by using information from the past, you can recover some of this information. And again, this is not strictly physical, and I'm happy to talk more about it to people who are interested. It's something that arises when you blur the field. There's the causal graph actually changes a bit, and you get influence from the memory. So it's not like storms um, like hours ago are raining now. It's just that these are links, information links that changed when you blurred the field and you use a coarser resolution model. So that's a really cool thing that you can study very systematically using these tools. Okay, and with that, 
uh, my answer is that yes, we can learn something new using machine learning as long as we have awesome data. And that's why we, we're so happy to welcome Andreas. And as long as you're quite systematic about it and think about what you learned at every step. And I'm going to put the many papers that inspired the study here. Little advertisement, we have a MOOC uh, with UCMWF if you want to learn more about machine learning for weather and climate. And thank you so much. Okay, so I think it's time to, to move on. So, and there will for sure be more room for uh, more detailed discussions with Tom later. Uh, so, um, we are pleased to now welcome Michi Lenning, oh, uh, Michi. Okay. with a professor of cryospheric sciences at EPFL, full professor. Um, so, then I think, um, Michi, you are not like, uh, you won't be awarded a prize at the end, I, I suspect. So, so, you cannot vote for, for Michi's presentation. For, so, so, yeah, thanks a lot to have accepted to, to give this presentation a few hours ago. And so, yeah. Yeah, right. so, so I almost feel like my, my best contribution would be not to speak, to save some time for those that are better prepared. So this is a talk that I just gave last week in, at the Klimarunde in, in, in Zurich, so the slides are in German. And I was just asked to, to jump in for, uh, as a replacement. So I will try to be quick and uh, save some time also since, uh, as, uh, as you know, we have been talking about atmospheric processes and we have heard a lot about what we are doing in, uh, in cryos about drifting and blowing snow, but this is a different subject. So we're going to look at renewable energy and uh, in particular, you know, what we can help with uh, knowing about wind and radiation in the mountains. And how we want to motivate this is um, first uh, we look at uh, the, the Swiss um, how the Swiss, they do their electricity. And, and what you see is that here, even now, you, you need to import electricity in the wintertime in Switzerland. So that's what is called the Winterlücke in German, or the, the winter electricity gap. So there is not enough production within Switzerland in the winter. And that's, that is already the case today when the nuclear power plants are still, while well, they are still running. So when you switch them off, then this gap may increase in the future, depending on how you try to replace it. And so we want to look at how that is, how that affects uh, if you now want to uh, have more uh, wind and solar-based electricity production in the future. So then uh, one, one thing is that uh, we, can, uh, we can do alpine PV, so we can put our solar panels in the mountains, and this is... Uh, a good idea for, for that problem because there is more radiation, there is less fog. So now, you know, if I was in, in the woods now, I would be in the sun and here I'm in the fog. <laughs> so that's a very, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this is a very typical winter uh, situation that we are today. And uh, so the, there's much more radiation, especially in the winter in the, in the mountains and the snow. Uh, does add to that because the snow reflects and it reflects radiation in a forward manner. And so you can put your panel in a way such that you most profit from this uh, forward scattered radiation on the snow. Does it work in practice? It does. So we have this uh, setup, this very uh, nice setup at Total uh, with uh, panels that have different tilts. And all of them are oriented to the south. And then when you see what they produce and you compare it, uh, you compare the 30 degrees to the 90 degrees, so vertical, or you optimize either for yearly production or for winter production, then you can calculate with models what this snow effect is, and you can see that it's quite uh, significant. So all of this that is circled here is, is just because of the snow. So that's, that's quite a bit, and that's in addition to you know, not, having, not having clouds at, at Totap and having much more radiation in the first place because the atmosphere is thinner, you are at higher elevation. Now, the, just note that if you compare the production at this place to a typical production at, uh, in, in, in oh, maybe not Lausanne, but in Verdensville, where it's even foggier than in Lausanne, so then, then it, you would get a factor four of production just in these winter months, right? So not, not yearly, but uh, so in the winter months where we mostly need electricity. So this is kind of what we know about uh, the radiation in the mountains. And the other thing is the wind, right? So wind, the people in Switzerland, they don't like to build wind turbines. Um, I don't know why exactly, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to build a wind turbine. And, um, 
it may have to do with that we don't know enough about winds in Switzerland. If you look on the right here, and then you see that this train has been has been uh, kicked out of uh, its tracks uh, by wind, and this is the famous Lasaya wind in the Schwendetal in Appenzellinerroden. And there, the, if the synoptic wind goes in this direction, then there's a local wind developing in the valley that goes actually opposite, and it's so strong that it that it uh, is able to do this damage, right? If it can do damage, it can also produce energy. Just as an example, right, there's many places in the mountains where you can uh, very successfully harvest wind energy, even if on average the wind in Switzerland is lower than over the North Sea, right? So that's that's not a question, but there is locations where you can good harvest good wind. On average, if we so if you look at some of the production profiles on the left, what you see is uh, distributed over the hour of the day, uh, the mean wind speed uh, uh, accumulated per month. And so we, what you see is that like on Chassara and the Jura, there's a lot of wind in the winter time in particular and less in the summer. And then many of the other uh, locations that are shown here, uh, for example, the valley station in, in the in the valley, they have uh, the opposite production profile where there is more wind during the day in the afternoon because of the uh, the valley wind uh, systems there. So again, you know, when you look in detail in the mountains, uh, then you can find the production profiles or wind profiles that would help your specific target. And if your target is to produce more energy in the winter then you can select locations that help you to achieve that. And this is what we are trying to address. Um, and so what, uh, what we do is um, we first uh, try to come up with uh, models that describe very high resolution wind profiles. This is also based on machine learning. It's uh, from a model that's called Wind Topo, developed by uh, Jérôme uh, Dujardin. And, and so he has been training a machine learning model with uh, data and has, has really good results on very high resolution wind models. As we heard from Andreas, it's very difficult to go to very high resolution. So this is at the, at the 20 meter resolution and uh, covers all of Switzerland and gives you hourly values of, of wind speed. Uh, if you wanted to do this with a weather model, good luck, right? So you would have uh, to have Alps would not be sufficient for that. And so this is why uh, it's useful first to, to know about um, the, these wind fields. And then <coughs> what we then try to do is now to come and combine these things. So wind, solar, and snow. So snow is not only good, it's also bad, as you can see here, when you put up a, a, a field of solar panels and then they get covered by snow, then they don't produce anymore and they get destroyed. They, and so there is now solutions being developed that avoid this accumulation. This is um, very efficient, but it has, of course, some disadvantages in the production. So there is uh, always trade-offs uh, to, be, to be looked at. And, uh, <coughs> and so there, with uh, fluid dynamics uh, models, we can simulate these features <coughs> and then can try to also for more simpler geometries, such as, uh, uh, for example, um, suggested for the Samedan side. And the, the contribution that we can do is then we can try to optimize the design for the specific locations where you try to uh, put these things. Okay, but that's not the only thing. So as I said, this was for the, the climate the talk in, uh, in, in, in Zurich. And um, of course now the question is not only on how to most efficiently produce energy, but also how to not damage your environment and your landscape uh, with these installations. And this is, uh, for example, uh, the biodiversity is a question. Does biodiversity suffer when you put solar panels or a wind turbine in the mountains? And then I, the, the answer is we don't know exactly, but it's very likely that if you put solar panels on a field like here in Samedan that has already been used for raising agriculture hay um, harvesting beforehand, then it's very likely that the solar panel does not do any damage, if at all of so, but, uh, but will maybe even increase the biodiversity. But if you put the solar panel, of course, in an untouched alpine environment, it will for sure damage uh, this environment to a certain degree. 
simply be not so much the panel itself, but all the infrastructure to going there, building a road, putting the foundation that will not go uh, without damage. So this is something that still needs to be investigated. But as I said, you know, this, the main message of this talk is that there um, are smart ways to combine wind and solar resources such that you fulfill a specific, uh, such that you uh, fulfill a specific uh, goal. And our goal is to try to produce uh, a balanced supply, especially in, in the winter. And so if we now put a compare, um, and this is a mod from the ORIS model that optimizes the placement of, uh, of wind and solar resources. If you now uh, tell the model that it should uh, mostly use urban PV, then you have a certain uh, gap in the winter production. By, and if you now replace the urban by alpine PV, then this winter um, gap uh, already decreases quite a bit. But what is even better, if you then allow the model to use almost 90% of wind, then you have this winter gap. Of course, this is purely theoretical. It's not going to happen in Switzerland, but it's good to know. That's what we think. Because you can also uh, tell people where they put things up, you know, where is the best locations for these wind and solar installations such that this uh, winter gap gets as small um, and, um, and, and then you can um, make uh, specific subsidies and things that would go towards this target, you know, without saying that these are the exact locations where these should be built. There's many other boundary conditions to be considered. But overall, um, I think wind energy would be a really good idea for Switzerland in, for many reasons. And, uh, and if you combine it smartly with Alpine, between Alpine PV and wind, um, you can get to much more stable and you don't need new nuclear, for example. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we are very pleased to, uh, to welcome um, Said uh, Obakrim, who is a uh, postdoc in the group of uh, Gregoire Marietto, the Gaia Lab. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Said. I'm a postdoc here at UNIL, and I will present a work that I did uh, at, uh, in France in a postdoc in France. So basically I'm doing uh, statistics and space-time statistics applied to environment. And here I will show uh, a model that we developed that is called MST weather gen that can be used to simulate multiple weather variables at space and time. I think I will skip the math details of, of the model. So as I said, this tool can be used to generate multiple weather variables in space and time. And the idea is to use recent advancement in space-time statistics to model the dependence structure between va these variables in space and, and time. So it can be used to generate uh, ensembles of weather data. We know that numerical models, they are really expensive to generate like multiple realizations of the weather process. So like statistical models are really, uh, have the advantage to, to be like less expensive computationally. So those models can be used for uh, impact studies. For example, I will show here an example of the fire risk. And we have an air package that everyone can use to use it to do simulations. So here I will show an example of the usage of this model in the region of PACA, southeast of France. And I will simulate multiple variables, humidity, precipitation, radiation, and maximum and minimum temperature in, uh, during the period from 2012 to 2021. And for the resolution of eight kilometers times eight kilometers. So we'll, I will run this model to simulate those variables in, in this area for this period. And then I will run the simulation and then I will try to estimate or uh, calculate the fire weather index, which is a meteorological based 
metric to assess fire hazards that's used by multiple, uh, multiple institutions. This, uh, this index is using multiple variables, so it's really a multivariate case. So it uses precipitation, temperature, relative humidity, and wind speed, and also the interaction between those, those variables in time. So it is really, a, here it is a usage example as well as a validation uh, method to, to validate our, our simulation method. So as I said, this index is integrating joint, uh, joint dynamics among these variables. So I run multiple simulations using the, the MST with Eugene, and then I calculated for each simul simulation the fire weather index for the summer for the period 2012-2021, and then calculate multiple statistics uh, like uh, the mean and percentile high and low percentiles in this region, and on the left we have the observed, sorry, we have the observed F FWE, and at the right we have the simulated one, and at the middle the simulated one, and right we have the bias, and we can say that first of all the spatial characteristic of FWI is well simulated, as well as like lower percentile and high percentile. We have some biases, especially some high biases in the high, uh, in the north east mountains. This is mountains um, region, it's quite complicated. But the bias actually is not really high, and the, for the fire weather index, those little changes does not really count because like if you have like fire weather index, if, if it's more than uh, 40, we already have a risk of the fire. So those small changes does not really count. So this tool is really nice for impact studies. For example, you can run it for other indexes, for other agriculture, for example, application. You, if you need, for example, multiple variables and multiple realizations of m these variables in space and time. So this model can be really nice and it can it run fast, faster than for sure numerical models. And now I will show the dynamics of these, of the fire weather index in three locations. Mountain is a location which has, which has a high risk of, uh, of, of fire, and we can see that the MST weather regime reproduces well uh, FWI, the dynamics of the FWI, and also we can see the seasonality is, will, is also well reproduced. So as I said, a summary MST weather regime reproduces well uh, observed FWI, so it's uh, FWI is a, um, a will usage, an example of usage example, uh, as I said, of this, uh, of this method, and also a validation technique to, s to say if our method uh, reproduces will the, the interdependence between variables. So how does MST with regime work? I think I will skip a lot of math details of of this method, but basically it has three components. The first component is weather types. And the middle, we have the transformation function, which is nonlinear transformation of the weather variables, and the latent Gaussian field. So weather types are just like a classification of the weather in terms of the characteristics of the weather in multiple cases, it's like a, a more general generalization of the, um, of the seasonal, seasonality. It's like going inside the seasons and see what's, if, the, if we have like other patterns that, uh, that characterize the weather. So inside each weather type, I will transform a multivariate space-time Gaussian field using a nonlinear uh, transformation function, which is here, Xi, 
and this transformation will give us the meteorological variable. So this is the, the mathematical uh, details of our model. I will skip, I will skip the method for estimating the, the weather types. And then for the transformation function, as I said, it's a nonlinear transformation function. And also if we, the psi minus one, the inverse of this, of this uh, function is a normalization function. It's like it normalize our, our variables, it transform it into uh, a Gaussian field. And then we will model this Gaussian field using space-time statistics. So for our Gaussian random field that we estimated using this, this equation, we will model it using space-time statistics using, uh, basically space-time statistics is interested in like the dependence structure between, between variables in space and time. And this uh, nice equation is just modeling the dependence between variables in space and time. So no need to read it. And for the conclusion, uh, as I said, a MST with regime can be used to simulate multiple variables in space and time. And we, we validated this method using, by trying to reproduce uh, fire weather index, and we see that it reproduces well this, this, this risk. And uh, this method can be used for risk assessment, either other risks rather than fire weather index, and some improvement can be done. For example, this model can not be used in large areas because we have a lot of non-stationarity, so uh, including non-stationary non covariance function to model non-stationality in between weather variables could be interesting, and also focusing on extremes. Thank you for your attention. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, so if not, thanks a lot. And so I take the opportunity to, to thank all the speakers of this session. It was really, really very, very uh, insightful. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I have the hard task to uh, get people back to uh, after this nice lunch break, but also very nice uh, talks in, in the morning. Uh, so I am Pauline Rivoire. I am a postdoc at UNIL, but also, I guess some of you know, I'm also a postdoc at the APFL, and you can see my poster related to that there. So I have two many things to talk about, but I'm very happy to talk today about this project on the identification of hydrometeorological drivers of forest damage in Europe. Uh, this is a project that started actually two years ago, or a bit more than two years ago, and I was very happy to show the first future step that I thought I would take during the first Atmospheric Science Day, then during the second Atmospheric Science Day I had a bit more fixed ideas, and now I hope to submit within the next few days. So it's my pleasure to talk about this collaboration. Uh, within groups at UNIL, but also uh, with uh, Sonia Dupuis at, uh, at uh, University of Bern. Uh, and so I'm a postdoc in the group of Daniela Domaise. Uh, a bit of context, and maybe to start with, uh, I go back to this image of uh, a normal state of the forest, losing some greenness and browning as uh, autumn is coming. This was the Black Forest last year, exactly one year ago, actually. Uh, trees turning orange, natural process, but not that much of a natural process when trees are browning during summer. As you can see here, the Jura beach forest after the extensive drought in summer 2018. Um, and so uh, this can happen in, during adverse conditions for forests, uh, especially drew, due to heat waves and drought that are actually projected to become more and more frequent, frequent due to climate change. And uh, on the other hand, early prediction of such forest damage can be highly beneficial for forest management to take act actions a bit in advance. So in this context, we were wondering, can we predict hydrometeorological conditions that are 
that are leading to such forest damage in Europe, so summer forest damage. And for that, we used the following framework to try to answer the research question. So among a set of potential hydrometeorological drivers, the idea was to, to identify which of them have an influence, when and what is the nature of the, this influence on forest greenness and especially on trying to predict low forest greenness events in Europe. And for that, we used random forest, and I think I didn't talk about that last year, so that's a new thing. Uh, so it's a bit of a forest deception because I'm using random forest to identify forest damage. Um, using, uh, yeah, uh, decision trees, a lot of, uh, a lot of meta, meta things here. Um, uh, first thing first, the impact data, the low greenness events. Uh, we have access to satellite observation of the normalized difference vegetation index, uh, NDVI, from the AVHR data sets between 1981 until, to, uh, until now, but 2022 for the, for the analysis. Um, and the idea was to upscale, because it's very uh, fine resolution, to upscale and process this satellite observation to a binary summary of the state of the forest for every summer. So for a given 0 0.1 greed point, uh, we say that there is a low greenness event if at least 80% of the forest pixels within this 0 0.1 grid, for at least 80% of the days in a given summer, experience a negative anomaly of the NDVI of the detrended NDVI. So every year for each grid point, we obtain this binary data, zero and ones, ones being the low greenness events. So indicating for a browning of the forest observed from, from, uh, from space. Then we have our potential hydrometeorological drivers. So we selected a set of seven different variables that we no can play a role on uh, the health of trees. D two meter temperature, dew point temperature, soil moisture at different depth, total precipitation and surface latent heat flux as a proxy for evapotranspiration and dew point temperature for, for air humidity. And uh, we, we obtain, we compute the anomalies for different months and seasons up to 18 months before the damage. So we have our binary data for July, August. Uh, for the, the, I, I forgot to say that, but our summer are just July, August. And uh, we look at the state of those different variables and the, the anomalies in July of the same year, June of the same year, and we go back in time until seasonal anomalies up to 18 months before the potential damage. Uh, so the idea is to investigate lagging impacts of prior hydrometeorological conditions. And each cells of this table that you, you can see here, kind of, is a potential predictor. So we have 70 potential drivers. And um, we feed all of this in our random forest model and uh, to obtain prediction. And then uh, I'm directly going to skip and go to the measure of skill for this prediction uh, model. We measure performance thanks to the critical success index, which is a measure of the ratio between true positive, true positive, false positive, and false negatives. And we see that we have a rather high, uh, uh, fairly high performance with 99% uh, of the grid points that have a critical success index greater than 0 0.5 and also uh, many, many grid points with a CSI greater than 0 0.75. We can also have a look at the area under the curve to check that actually this performance doesn't depend on the cutoff level that we calibrated for the, for the CSI. And uh, I don't remember at what time we started. I lost track of time, but how long do I have left? Thank you. <laughs> I get very good, perfect. And uh, um, the random forest has a very useful output that is 
a measure for the importance of a predictor, the mean decrease accuracy. So here I'm showing for one grid point here in uh, Eastern France, uh, what are the 10 most important predictors because they have the <coughs> highest mean decrease accuracy. It's, it's just a measure of uh, how much the prediction is impacted when we take out uh, a given variable. So if it's a, a large loss of accuracy, then it's an important variable. Uh, and something quite nice too is to have a look at, for each predictor, what is the influence on the probability of having a, a forest damage. So this is shown thanks to the, the partial dependence plots. On the x-axis here, I am selecting only the most important variable, which is maximum dew point temperature in March of the same year for this grid point and the, the different anomalies on the x-axis of this variable. And on the y-axis, you have the partial dependence with forest damage. So if you have a high partial dependence, it means that this variable, when it has positive anomalies, it's going to increase the probability of having a forest damage. You can do it for all the, all the, the variables. And here, basically, you see that also positive anomalies of two meter temperature in, in June of the same year will increase the probability of having a forest damage and soil moisture of the preceding year uh, in summer also increasing. So if we have a low soil moisture, so dry conditions the summer before, increasing the probabilities of having a forest damage this summer, following summer. Uh, OK, so we have the importance of the variable. We have some partial dependence for each of the predictors. So um, what I'm showing here is a summary for all the grid points of is this variable important or, or not in general for all the grid points. So each cell, again, is one uh, predictor. And the color indicates the percentage of grid points among all our forest grid points that selected this variable or this variable or for each variable as in one of the top 10 predictors. So what I was showing before on the plots. So we can see, like, we have an overview of what, what are the important time periods, like uh, especially uh, early, early summer and uh, late spring seem to be important. Um, and what are the important variables? So maximum two meter temperature seems to play a big role in general over Europe and, uh, and uh, also soil moisture, but also some influence one year before in, in spring. We can differentiate depending on the forest type. And I'm going to go very quickly on this one. Uh, if we focus on broadleaf forest and we zoom in on what's, why is this variable so important, we can plot the partial dependence, but for all the grid points. And we can see that, indeed, we have quite a homogeneous signal, like the positive anomalies of June uh, maximum two meter temperature are in general increasing the probability of having a forest damage. And same for two meter temperature in May. And if we look at uh, what, what's happening a bit uh, one year before with um, dew point temperature, negative anomalies, so dry conditions uh, in spring the year before seem to have an influence and are uh, increasing the probability of a forest damage. We can do the same with coniferous forest, just to say that the signal is a bit more heterogeneous, but we can, we can, we, we can differentiate the signal depending on the latitude of the grid point. And I will directly now go to the conclusions. So, uh, so all in all, it's a fast, automated, and flexible method that we showed quite good performance uh, to identify important variables and time periods, as we saw on the previous plot to predict low forest greenness events in Europe. And a uh, detail is uh, the hydrometeorological variables that I considered here, they are all available um, as uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal forecast products. So this is what motivated the choice at the beginning for these specific variables in particular. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave you on this uh, healthy forest image. OK, Fatima is our next presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm so happy that uh, I'm presenting here. Uh, as uh, the subject uh, actually shows that I'm going to talk about how we can have high resolution uh, snow data from uh, low resolution 
climate data forecasting actually. And this is a collaboration between UC Berkeley and Union. And um, I want to also thank you, my both supervisors, Gergo Marietto and Manuela. So without their supervision, it was impossible for me uh, <laughs> to do so. <laughs> but how I can go to the next slide? Ah, oh, here, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, Andrew uh, gave a nice uh, examples uh, how the resolution actually is important in many studies and uh, in the, also in the climate. And uh, I'm showing a part of California. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm showing a, a part of a California elevation map in the up that you can see that the elevation is varies. And uh, based on the elevation and many other factors, like uh, land cover, a snow also could vary. That I'm in the down showing the snow water equivalent. Actually, it is a variable uh, that shows how much water we can have from a snow. And the green shows, uh, OK, uh, less snow. Uh, and uh, when we are going to the blue, it means uh, more uh, snow. And actually, there are uh, several methods that try to, uh, from course resolution data, go to the more um, detailed data, high resolution. And uh, the name of them could be kind of, uh, we can uh, actually group them in two groups, like a statistical and dynamical uh, methods. Uh, and uh, in, uh, if I want to give a, a summary a, a little bit about these two methodology, statistical, as its uh, name also suggests, try to find the patterns between the variables, uh, uh, low resolution and uh, high resolution, and then try to predict. Uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, very easy to implement and also low cost computing comparing to physical uh, models. Uh, but a physical model, uh, it has more uh, details on physics. Uh, so this is a positive point of that, but uh, it is also high computing. And uh, also, it's uh, unlike the statistical model, it's very good also in the uh, extreme event ca uh, capturing. But if we could go something in between, if we could have uh, um, actually a high resolution data, um, considering uh, a part of physics and also uh, statistically look at this down scale, it would be very uh, interesting, and this is uh, kind of our approach on that. Uh, uh, so the methodology uh, starts with the selecting uh, the best features. It depends that which variable we want to actually down scale. For our case, which is uh, now a snow, uh, its temperature and precipitation probably one of the most uh, um, features, but uh, for other cases it can be varies, and uh, this feature selection could be by actually trying different set of uh, features and then uh, see that what we can um, get uh, from those and select the best ones. And uh, then we have uh, some learning days that in our learning days we have the high resolution data and also we have the selected feature low resolution data that you can see that I am putting in a window, so uh, this is what uh, we can kind of get physics from that, uh, that uh, we do not look at the same day, especially for SNO in our case, uh, that uh, because SNO is uh, depend to the previous days also. We can have SNO somewhere uh, that is, comes from two months ago, or uh, I don't know, one day before, so it varies. Uh, so uh, then uh, we can have our learning database and query database. Uh, uh, that in the query, we don't have the high resolution, but we still have the climate data, low resolution data. And then we compute a distance matrix between them and try to estimate, actually, the target data based on the, uh, our uh, best candidates in learning data sets. So uh, we uh, actually uh, use this uh, methodology in uh, Western US uh, to uh, <laughs> estimate uh, a snow water equivalent for, for past days using WRF CMIP-6 climate models in nine kilometer date uh, and it's daily. And the reanalysis uh, snow data, uh, which is available also uh, daily. Uh, and try to actually estimate for past and to see that how this uh, model works. 
And then we compared with in situ observation with additional uh, independent uh, SNO data set. Uh, and uh, also we try to put some uh, days out of learning and test uh, that how it really uh, works in the reference data set. Uh, here uh, I show uh, a video and uh, you can see uh, on the left the reference SUI, uh, which is when we go to uh, white to blue, the SUI is uh, increasing. And this is our estimation in the middle, and the difference between the reference and the uh, estimated is uh, in delta sui, which is shown here. That is, when it is really near to zero, it shows a uh, white uh, kind of. I, uh, I just play it in a very uh, fast way that you can see how it works with different dates. Okay, because days are after, one after each other. Some of them are very uh, similar to each other, but when I go further, you can see that it's changing. But because uh, we are also in a snow, it's also important to see that uh, how it works really in a one point data set. Uh, that's why reason that we have three uh, stations here that you can see uh, I'm showing for five years uh, the snow water equivalent uh, changing uh, and uh, the one that we estimated are in red. And others are actually other well-established data set in uh, US that uh, you can see that uh, our estimation is kind of uh, very close to the well-established data. So uh, we have done this uh, for uh, US uh, and um, now what about Switzerland actually? Uh, we decided uh, to actually forecast for future. Uh, so in Switzerland we have CH 2018 which is the um, actually uh, localized down a scaling of CMIP5, uh, and it, it is from 1950 till uh, 2100. Uh, it's a very nice data set. Uh, and uh, we also have the Meteo Suisse uh, for those days, like past uh, history days, uh, which is observation actually. Uh, and uh, we try to do it for uh, uh, Swiss Alps, not uh, focusing on the other regions mostly in the high elevation uh, area that uh, I'm showing here. And, uh, but uh, we have several climate models and uh, we just want to focus on those that are really closing and matching the Meteo Suisse observation in, in, the, in our uh, interested features like temperature and precipitation. That's why we compare them uh, for each tile in the historical time and then select the three best rank models based on this comparison that we continue with this model instead of uh, having uh, all other models. Uh, and the uh, learning data sets uh, that uh, we are using uh, for the historical is uh, coming from Meteo Swiss uh, Special uh, Climate Analysis and uh, the actually uh, snow water equivalent is coming from the temperature index model. They have it for uh, almost 20 years. Yeah, but for the prediction, we use the climate data of CH 2018, which is two kilometer and daily, and try to estimate. Uh, so I'm just showing uh, how, how we can uh, be in future. Uh, here I'm showing the March, uh, average March uh, um, snow that we have for 20 years almost in uh, Swiss Alps. And if we continue uh, using uh, uh, RCPP uh, 4.5, which shows that, okay, till mid-century, uh, we will increase the green gas, um, like what we are doing now. And then from 2040, we will decrease on that. And you can see that, okay, in 2060, the difference that the uh, if it is red, it shows that we will have less snow, actually. Uh, in future, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, almost similar thing if we go with this uh, um, perspective that we will decrease in the middle of the center uh, the, the, the green gas emission. Uh, but if we continue like uh, the business, uh, like we are all doing now, then we would have much more or less uh, snow in future, and uh, then we should really think about it, uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so in summary, if I want to summarize, uh, we propose a methodology for downscaling uh, uh, climate variables. Here I showed in SNO, but it can be also used for other climate variables. Uh, and uh, then uh, based on this methodology, we can go to the past, current, and future, 
and it has a global potential uh, to be used. Uh, and, uh, uh, and because we are using different GCMs, it also gives off ensemble of prediction for future. And thank you very much. Hi, so my name is Milton. Uh, I am here to talk to you about post-processing neural weather model outputs for TC intensity prediction. Uh, let me start out by just thanking some collaborators for this, uh, Louis Blanazo, Alexis Bern, and Tom Buckler. Without Louis, this would have been impossible. He did a lot of work to actually run these models here at UNIL. Um, the two professors have been very insightful with their feedback. And I also want to give a special shout out to Monica, who, uh, Monica Feldman, who helped with sanity checking the outputs for these neural weather models. So uh, for those of you who are into atmospheric science, and I'm going to guess that there's a lot of you here, um, you may be aware that their advancements in AI have shown a lot of promise, right? And we have models that come from um, at least four big models that you are likely aware of are is forecast model V2, which was made by NVIDIA, uh, Graphcast, which was made by Google, Fango Weather by Huawei, and IFS, AIFS, I can speak, um, which was developed by the ECMWF. Now, how well do they do? Well, if you look at this graphic from the New York Times in uh, this year, when you had Beryl, they uh, compared the outputs from Graphcast against the predictions from the National uh, Hurricane Center model and the ECMWF's model for the track. And as you can see from that nice little yellow line, um, it did a significantly better job. And one very important part is that Graphcast has not seen this year's data, which means we are happy with that. So it seems that, at least if you look at the popular media, that these models can give you a very nice output that you can try to process. Um, and how do they do this? If you look at ForecastNet v2, um, one of the things that they're trying to do is they're ultimately saying, can we learn a series of filters that can help you map uh, states of the atmosphere one to the other? Uh, for GraphCast, instead, you're trying to represent the state of the atmosphere uh, in some sort of latent graph representation um, that will allow you to decode into the future. And then for Pangu Weather, um, you have the transformer architecture, which ultimately uses the inputs to look at, can I build a query, a key, and a value that I learned from the data itself to find out what the state of the future of the atmosphere should be in the future. Now, how well do they do? They do quite well when it comes to um, the variables that you train them on. You can look at this in Weatherbench, but I'm going to plug Monica's paper here, well, which I am a co-author on. But it, you can see that at least for Cape, you have a reasonable answer, but for calculated fields, we do generally see that neural weather models, because of the inherent uh, physical inconsistencies, whenever you're doing, uh, you're trying to find fields that are calculated based on the fields themselves, you can end up having a larger uh, error bias, depending on how largely each one of those different fields that you're basing your calculations on are affected. However, we still find that the models can provide useful information, which is something that we're very happy with. Now, what this leads me to is the question of, can we use these to, can we use the outputs of these models to better uh, predict or, uh, well, yes, predict the intensity of hurricanes in the future? Now, how are we going to do this? We know that these models are trained to uh, essentially simulate ERA-5, which is part of the reason why they do so well. Um, however, we also know that ERA-5, when you compare it to our best records, in other words, IB tracks, um, they fall short on the prediction of maximum sustained wind and on the minimum sea level pressure, right? Um, but we can take advantage of these uh, records and say, well, can I post-process a neural network, uh, can I post-process the outputs of these neural networks in order to make a prediction of um, what the uh, intensity, that is the maximum 
surface winds and the minimum sea level pressure are going to be in the future. Now, in order to do that, um, we wanted to propose a very simple framework, which is once you grab the air five initial conditions, you use a neural weather model to, um, because these are um, recurrent models, in other words, you predict the state of the atmosphere one time step into the future, and then you use those outputs to train it for, to predict the next state uh, and so forward in an iterative fashion, then we can use this to generate a series of outputs in the future. And with that, we can then look at the areas around the cyclones that we care about. Now, in order to be, um, to set this up in a simple way that doesn't require uh, tracking the cyclones, we thought, well, let's look at the historical movement of these cyclones and look at how far my bounding box should be in order to not have to um, necessarily track the cyclones in the outputs of these weather models. Um, part of that being because A, it's simpler, B, you don't have to keep the entire record and then this will allow us to try to make a prediction depending on the lead time. Um, and what does that look like? Well, let me go ahead and open a YouTube short and you can see what Pango Weather thinks, uh, in this case, Hurricane Maria looks like. Um, and you can see that for each one of the time steps, you are predicting a certain lead time up to in the future. And you can see the cyclones um, moving. Now, Maria is over here. As you're moving into the future, you can see that it translates closer to the bounding box. And once again, this is so that you don't um, cheat, right? Because you don't know where cyclones are going to be in the future. So if you're putting yourself in the predictive um, problem, you can't tell it it's going to be here, right? When you're trying to post-process, if you're going to train a simple neural network to try to uh, post-process these outputs. So. And I'm not going to open the other one. So what are we going to do first? We're going to set up a very simple, naive post-processing framework, right? What's the first thing that you could do? Well, let's assume that you can somehow combine these outputs into a line. Let's model it using a line. And I'm going to implement that with PyTorch just so that I have the same workflow for all the models that I am going to um, want to compare it against. Um, one of the important points is that I, in the inputs, I use the minimum and maximum of each of the neural weather model outputs. And this I did because I wanted to give um, some form of the same information that you had or that you were going to feed a more complex model into this very simple, naive approach. Um, in terms of the fields that I used, uh, or rather we used, was, it was the surface winds because you're going to use that to try to uh, get an idea for the um, maximum surface wind speed. Um, the mean sea level pressure, because hopefully that's, you can find some sort of relationship with that and the minimum sea level pressure, right? And then the low level temperature, so T850 hectopascals and the mid-level geopotential height. Um, and these two were chosen because they were, um, from what you can see in the weather branch results, two fields that were very well captured by the neural weather models. Um, in addition to that, you have uh, an assumption, well, you know that when you're going to predict into the future, you know how strong the storm currently is. So you have your baseline intensity, and you know how far into the future you're going to predict, so you have your lead time, and all of this is what you're going to be trying to predict with. And in order to have a sort of fair comparison against something else, you also uh, can use the air five initial conditions as opposed to using the outputs on the neural weather models to see if you're getting information that you don't have in the initial conditions in order to post process or to get the prediction or are you just getting some additional noise. Now, um, the first step is to check, well, with this multiple linear regression model, do the learning curves, like do you have a, an error metric that is similar enough between your training set and your validation set? In other words, do you have some sort of amount of confidence in the uh, generalizability of your algorithm? Uh, short 
yes. Then when you look at uh, your forecast skill, one of the things that you will see is that um, Pangu weather does about the same or a little bit worse for short lead times than initial conditions. And as time goes on, Pangu weather does better than just using initial conditions with this very naive model, right? And this is without leveraging any of the spatial information that you get from the neural weather model outputs. Um, so the next part is to attempt to get something from the spatial, from the spatial information that you have. Uh, for that, I use CNNs. Um, in the end, the problem is that CNNs are very much overfitting currently, and these are just preliminary results and work in progress. Um, it doesn't appear to be a difference in the distributions of between the training and the test, sorry, the training and the validation sets. And one of the things that I want to try and that I'm currently working on is like when you look at the domain size, you look say, hey, you know, there's a lot of extra, extra information that the algorithm probably has a problem with. Um, so can I try masking that? And that's one of the hopes that it's going to be a little bit better. Uh, and so with that, I'm just going to end. Oh, uh, hello, everybody. I am Sergio Gonzalez. Um, oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I am Sergio Gonzalez, and I am working in a Cryos lab and SLF with Mickey Lenning. And I am, work, and I am going to uh, talk about uh, how we are trying to understand the uh, future of uh, snow regimes in uh, different mountain environments. So <clears throat> here I start with two images of this January. One is in the Alps, another is in Pamir. You can see that in the snow, we can see different from satellite images uh, of uh, Sentinel. We can see different processes are occurring in both images. Uh, this is on particular day. Uh, if you check other days, the snow images are so, is totally different. So they are going different processes. They are days that uh, they are similar. They are days that uh, they are separated. But uh, our uh, aim of our goal for this uh, project is to understand uh, how they are, uh, what are the processes that are occurring in these uh, snow environments and how they are going to change with climate change. So <clears throat> for uh, evaluating the future of this snow climate, uh, we need, uh, we need uh, model simulations. But uh, so far, uh, most of the model simulations for snow are either one point uh, simulations with uh, one very complex snow model or distributed uh, simulations with uh, uh, complicated uh, atmospheric models, but quite simplistic representation of the, of the snow. Uh, we want to do both. So we have, uh, and uh, Daniel already explained it this morning, uh, or the tool of our uh, lab that is uh, CryoWorf, that it tries to combine both worlds. Uh, we have the very well-known uh, weather research forecast, WORF, with a uh, snowpack as a surface model and including a blowing uh, snow scheme that Daniela talked this morning. And with that, we can uh, better assess snow and snow and atmospheric interactions. And this is our main tool for working on snow climates. But we have a problem that is surprise. We explained quite a lot this morning about uh, all this. Uh, these simulations are com uh, computationally expen expensive at very high resolution. <clears throat> so our approach is to do storylines with uh, pseudo-global warming uh, methods uh, that is simulate uh, one event. Well, in this case, the event is one full, snow uh, one full snow season in different mountains in the Alps and Pamir at three kilometer resolutions and simulate in the present and simulate it in the future. For the future, we change the initial conditions using this pseudo-global warming approach. And uh, that basically we change using uh, the SIMIP seeds, uh, the SIMIP seeds delta change. And we of course correct uh, by the changes 
in forcings created by the uh, thermal gradient change. And we can compute, we can estimate the climate change forcing uh, just, uh, just by uh, the subtracting the future and the historical uh, simulations. <clears throat> so doing this approach, we, uh, we made the simulations in our uh, two domains, in the Alps and the Pamir. And you can see in the right hand side that in the Alps, the response of the snow, this is the, the plots show the, waters, uh, the water storage in the snow in all the or domain, <coughs> the evolution. We can see how these changes are quite linear with the forcing. Here we have in blue the present, and then we have two possible futures at the end of the century. W the one with SSP uh, 4.5, and the one uh, with SSP uh, 5.8.5. And we can see that this change is quite linear. But when we are going to another mountain domain in Pamir, uh, this change totally. Now we have in blue, here I cannot show it, but it's just like here below. It's, uh, we have less water storage as snow then, for example, we could have in, in the two different futures, in SSP 4.5 and, and 5.5. <clears throat> and even the processes are different because it starts to, to melt before. So, but these are regional assess assessments, and we don't want to uh, analyze regional assessments, but we want to analyze the general changes in snow climates. Then we need to classify snow climates. The problem is that uh, so far, most of the, uh, the current global snow classifications are quite simplistic and based to, uh, on categorical classification that don't distinguish between snow processes. So based in, uh, or inspired by precipitation microphysical classification methods, uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, we perform uh, PCAs, uh, principal com component analysis, uh, on different meteorological and snow variables. And we can see in the middle and in the right plot how this, the different, uh, each point represents one point, one geographical point on our domain in the space, in the space phase of the air temperature, mean air temperature and the uh, snow water equivalent maximum. So we can see that what is distributed in different uh, regionalizations, now we can group it in four, uh, in four groups of, with different snow processes. <clears throat> if we zoom in a little bit, we can see, I have no time for explaining in detail, but we can see that we have two groups with, uh, with low uh, three mats, the, the green one and the red one, <clears throat> one with more mild temperatures and the other with more cold temperatures. And we have another group with very cold mean temperatures and middle uh, three mats, and another group that has a lot of uh, very high three mats, but uh, and mid temperatures. <clears throat> and we can see how it, they are distributed in our domains we have still some uh, points that are not classified. <clears throat> but now we are uh, looking on what is gonna happen in the future. And for see, this is very complicated plot, so I am gonna tell you to only uh, focus on this, on the plot of uh, SSP 5.85. <clears throat> we can see in dash area, is where it was the where it was in the present simulations, and in the in the straight lines we can see what is going what is going to happen in the in this climate scenario, and we can see for example that the group three is besides is going is going to increase the, temp the mean temperature, it's going to increase in the snow. It's not going to decrease the snow. And it's going to go a little bit towards where it is the group four, the yellow one, while the group, uh, this group four is descending quite dramatically on the snow. On the snow. 
There are the other groups where the green one also decreases while the red one is not. So what we are, take, what we are seeing is that the snow climate presents nonlinear changes. And indeed, <clears throat> we are seeing as well some regime shift. So we can see, for example, in Pamir that many blue points are uh, becoming yellow points on or in, uh, or in the Alps, where many yellow points are becoming green. So we are observing uh, regime shifts in the future. <clears throat> Here is a plot that I am not going to explain. So the conclusions are first that the snow evolution is nonlinear in Pamir, but uh, more predictable in the Alps if we, under, if we check it in as a regional assessment. <clears throat> but uh, to assess the global patterns of snow climates, we classified in four snow climates in different mountain environments with an objective method that it was not existing. <clears throat> and we observe, thanks to that, that the snow climates present nonlinear changes. Uh, some snow increase in SWE and another uh, snow, another geographical points decrease. And we observe that there is some uh, regime shifting from one climate to others. So, thank you very much. And just for finishing, I would uh, I like a lot to see here how many uh, tools that has been presented for avoiding that uh, this for imp improving our resilience on these things that happen these days in Valencia that to me touch me because of geographical proximity. Thanks. Uh, we have 15 minutes for the break, but uh, thank you everybody for keeping on time. Um, and yeah, go have coffee. Uh, to start this session, uh, we have Nora Bergner uh, from the EERL lab at EPFL, who's going to talk to us about aerosol uh, and clouds in polar regions. So thank you, Nora. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So yeah, today I'm going to present you some work on understanding aerosols and clouds in polar regions. And this is not just my work, but I'm presenting a combination of different results from other PhD students from my lab, so namely Ivo, Benji, Roman, and, my, and myself, and of course with many contributions of other people as well. So I'm part of the Extreme Environment Research Lab. We are based in Sion, and um, we're headed by Julia Schmale, and I think we all work on aerosol and cloud processes in the Arctic and Antarctic, but today I'm just gonna focus on the Arctic. And as you maybe know, the Arctic is warming three to four times faster compared to the rest of the globe, and this is particularly strong uh, during winter time and also in the central Arctic. And this leads to very drastic changes in the environment there. So we have like this sea ice um, decline, but also there's um, Arctic wildfires and other changes. And this changes the sources and also the properties um, of the aerosols. But then aerosols, they interact with radiation and also with cloud and therefore have in turn an impact on the climate. Um, but these climate forcing and the feedbacks with respect to the Arctic aerosol changes is still very uncertain. And the Arctic aerosol sources and processes are generally very complex um, and are governed by a strong seasonality because we have polar day and we have polar night. Um, so for example, during winter time, it's quite common to have long range transport from pollution sources and then this accumulates and it's called Arctic haze. And in the, in the summer, um, the atmosphere is a bit more pristine and more like local sources um, dominate. But one of the problem is that most of what we know about the Arctic is based on these land-based stations that you see around here. But there's like a gap or like there's limited observations in the central Arctic and also during winter time because it's just a very remote and um, region which is difficult to assess. Um, but this is also like the time where we saw Arctic amplification is strongest. So we really want to fill this gap. And also, usually um, when we are interested in the climate feedback of aerosols or the climate effect of aerosols, we are interested in aerosols that um, lead to cloud droplet formation and they are called cloud condensation nuclei or CCN or um, particles that lead to ice formation. So ice nucleic particles or INPs. And like these droplets or INPs they change the microphysical properties of the clouds and also their radiative impact. So if they emit more long-wave radiation or reflect more short-wave radiation and so on. 
And yeah, another problem is that we, what we have, the observations from these stations are usually happening on the ground. But we care about the aerosol at cloud levels. So this is like the question of the, if this is rep representative of the vertical structure of the atmosphere. Um, so this brings me to my research questions, which I will address today. So what are the sources and characteristics of aerosol in the central Arctic? And also, how do aerosols from both above and below low-level low clouds influence the cloud condensation nuclear budget? And um, regarding the methods, so it's very fortunate that in recent years, there has been quite some effort to fill these observational gaps in the central Arctic. So there have been several um, ship-based campaigns, so namely um, the mosaic campaign, so where the ship drifted for an entire um, year in the central Arctic. So we have a lot of um, aerosol microphysical and chemical properties for an entire seasonal cycle. But there's also been other campaigns, also like the out of May campaign um, near Svalbard, and there, Roman, my colleague, he flew a tethered balloon from the ship. So we have vertical information um, from this campaign as well. So I'm starting with some of the characteristics and sources of aerosol in the Central Arctic. Um, so Ivo, he looked at the characteristics and sources of fluorescent aerosol. And the reason why we're interested in fluorescent aerosol is that it can hint to primary biological particles. And these particles are thought to be efficient ice nucleators. But ice nucleated particles are difficult to measure. And so it's a lot easier to measure fluorescent particles. And what he saw is that especially during the summer, um, I don't know if you can see the mouse. Ah, yeah. oh, there it is. Um, we have a lot of these um, fluorescent types, like in the blue and gray, and also um, biological activity. And this, yeah, like these fluorescent observations hint to biological activity, activity and also um, warm temperature ion peas. And during the winter time, we have like this fluorescent type B, which is rather associated to anthropogenic pollution. But if we look at the high time resolution data set, we also have like spikes of these fluorescent types that hint to biologic activity. And um, so there's the question of like in the winter time, like there, there's a hint of biological sources, but where they're exactly coming from is still very unclear. So is it maybe the leaves, the sea ice, is it um, precipitation which is supplementing? So many questions to still address. And another process which is also very relevant in the central Arctic is um, sea salt aerosol, the aerosol from wind-driven processes, namely that um, aerosol is produced from sublimating blowing snow, which has so far been not uh, included in climate model models, for example, but it's an important source of aerosol in the central Arctic. And um, with these observations from mosaic, these blue um, shaded areas, are all blowing snow events. So we observe this process fairly frequently in the Arctic, and it leads to an increase of aerosols in all sizes, and also like an increase of these um, cloud condensation nuclei and also scattering. And then this has possible impacts on yeah, scattering cloud properties and therefore climate feedbacks. And uh, Bendy, um, he looked at the chemical composition of um, Arctic aerosol. And he found that during the winter time, so this Arctic haze period, um, sulfide is the, has the largest contribution, contribution to PM1 aerosol. And in the summer, the largest contribution comes from organics. And in the, his observations, the, um, especially sulfide and organics, they are fairly comparable to the seasonal cycle, like to the levels of these Pan-Arctic stations. But ammonium is a lot lower, which has um, impacts on acidity and also, in addition, there's like high time resolution viability in the chemical composition with maybe like also warm air mass intrusion, which are not captured by land mass on these land based like low time resolution filter based analysis. Um, but now I want to also come to the aerosols at cloud level. Um, so this is based on the out of melt campaign and Roman's work. And this is a case study in June 2023, where there was a low-level um, cloud observed. So here you see the cloud, and these profiles are like the <coughs> flight profiles of the helicide, like the tethered balloon that we have. And from these vertical profiles of the atmosphere, we can see that there was a temperature inversion inside the cloud. So the cloud was um, 
actually coupled to the surface. So there's, um, there can be errors are transported to the clouds from the surface, but we also see that there's a difference between the moisture content below and above the clouds. So it's a lot lower above the cloud. And we also see that um, above the cloud, there's a lot, like more than two times uh, more particles and also cloud condensation nuclei than below the cloud. And even though the cloud is coupled to the surface, the aerosols from above the cloud are needed to explain the observed cloud droplet number concentration. So this means that there has been, or there must have been aerosol entrainment from above the cloud into the cloud to observe, like to explain the observed um, cloud droplet numbers. And this has also implications of how representative then the aerosol observation at the surface are for what we observe in the cloud. And with that, I already come to my conclusions. Um, so we see that biological sources of fluorescent aerosol um, are, are, are present in the summer, but then also during like ep episodic events in winter time. And we also have learned from the mosaic expedition that windsock aerosol is, has a very important contribution to the aerosol and also the CCN budget, from, especially from fall to spring. And regarding the chemical, com chemical composition, so sulfate, and organic aerosol levels are similar in the central Arctic compared to these land-based stations, but lower ammonium concentrations and higher return for timescales time scales are different. And also from this um, case study, we see that, aerosol, that an aerosol source above the surface covered cloud is needed to explain um, the observed cloud droplet number concentrations, but of course this needs higher statistic um, or like more cases to confirm this result. And with that, I thank you very much, and I'm open for your questions. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, my name is Fabien Solmond. I worked actually in um, um, Observatoire midi Pyrenees in Toulouse, and I also used to work at uh, ICTP 3 Este. So it's a bit rough from here, but it turns out that um, for family reasons, I spend a lot of time in uh, Nyon, Switzerland, and it was very nice. Uh, uh, of the organizer to let me, um, uh, you know, come to this meeting today. I, I found it very interesting. So m my, my talk is uh, quite general. I'm going to tell you about, uh, you know, uh, the interaction between aerosol and uh, the African climate, specifically African monsoon uh, region. Okay. So African monsoon <coughs> is a very uh, important region because uh, a lot of people li live in uh, the West African uh, region. Okay. And the monsoon, you know, results from the northern shift of the ITCZ. Okay, monsoon variability is influenced, of course, by you know global factors, but also is influenced by regional factors. For example, uh, the heat low, sar the Saran heat low activity, the onset of the cold tongue in the Atlantic. You know that is going to set some uh, energy gradient conditions uh, for in order to the monsoon and the convection uh, to penetrate inland. <clears throat> it's also a very active system, you know, with front Af African easterly wave passing and a lot of convection, which is, of course, very important for uh, precipitation and, and, and water resource. So aerosol in this picture, they can uh, influence the monsoon because they are going to uh, modify, actually, they can modify this gradient of energy uh, between, uh, you know, the colder ocean and the very warm Sahara and, and so impact precipitation. <clears throat> so... Very generally, you know, at the global scale, it has been shown that actually aerosol in the northern hemisphere are, have a global connection, actually, to the, uh, the monsoon regime, okay? And some studies have, like, pointed out the role of, um, you know, the, the sulfate aerosol in northern hemisphere as a contributor, as a, as a possible cause of the drought uh, in Sahel during the 80s. <clears throat> but really, I'm going to focus more on the you know, regional uh, aspect of aerosol and discuss here the role of dust aerosol and biomass bar burning aerosol, which are two big main actors in this uh, system uh, and, you know, very uh, uh, overfly over uh, their impact on the West African monsoon. So, uh, starting with dust, actually. Starting with dust, actually. So, the dust monsoon interaction, you know, they're uh, studied uh, using modeling approaches in which actually uh, dust transport emission and radiative effects are uh, um, accounted for uh, in model and uh, interact uh, with the dynamics. <clears throat> uh, 
And so if you look at uh, you know, uh, the response of the monsoon to uh, dust perturbation, okay, you can find actually two kinds of main response in, uh, in global uh, GCMs, including the semi uh, models. Okay, and those are like depicted on this picture. First, actually, um, you have uh, the, this uh, elevated heat pump response. Okay, so dust, they are going to perturb uh, the energy gradient in, uh, you know, uh, via actually the strong surface extension that tends to induce a surface cooling and a stabilization, and also a strong diabatic warming uh, in the atmosphere where the dust uh, resides. Okay, so actually, the, the, some, some model that um, um, react positively to the strong diabetic warming, okay, tends to have a sort of enhanced precipitation response, where actually the diabetic warming is uh, triggering actually uh, more convection and more inflow of moisture, so it's a self-alimenting system, <coughs> with, uh, as a result, more precipitation. And this is typically the model that we see on the top right, okay? And so this elevated heat pump had been proposed uh, as a mechanism. On the other hand, some, some other models have an opposite response to this, uh, to this, where actually it's more, if you want, uh, the stabilization effect that wins on average <coughs> as a response, and where actually convection is inhibited by the stronger surf, uh, surface cooling uh, that tends to stabilize and leads to less precipitation with, uh, you know, uh, diminution uh, uh, of moisture flux, meridional uh, moisture flux. And it's typically the response that you see done here with a negative precipitation anomaly induced by dust. Okay? <coughs> so a very important uh, parameter for that is actually the, the role of dust absorption properties that could be very variable due uh, to uh, dust mineralogy, the uncertainties on, on, on uh, distribution size, and actually, in this study, uh, based on the regional climate model, we had shown that only, uh, uh, you know, a, a small differences in the single scattering albedo that quantify diffusion over absorption for dust particles can result in pretty different precipitation response, as you see here. On the left, actually, you have a meridional cross-section cross of cloud um, circulation and precipitation anomaly, you know, in the, in the red region here. <clears throat> and you can see that actually in this standard case we obtain uh, a drying induced by dust, but as soon as you start increasing the absorption in the, of the dust particle, you have this elevated heat pump uh, mechanism that kicks on, okay, and the precipitation anomaly change with, you know, going towards a more positive precipitation response. At the opposite, if we have very diffusive dust, then a very strong drying is obtained, as a result of the stabilization and the very strong cooling versus diabetic warming. <coughs> so, okay, so this, was a, this is already a bit old, but there have been a lot of new constraints, actually, uh, uh, observational constraints, constraint the model about uh, on size distribution, on mineralogy, for example, the role of hematite is very important, okay, taking into account the different, the, the, the color of the dust, if you want, is, uh, is very important, and also on the long wave properties. And actually, it turns out that recently, this elevated heat pump hypothesis uh, tends to dominate now uh, if we account for these um, uh, new properties that actually simulate more absorption, especially um, uh, over the Sahel region. <coughs> All right, of course, this was uh, actually a very, an average picture, but in fact, it turns out that the interaction of dust and weather system is very important. It's going to shape, you know, the mean precipitation response. Even with a very simple model, uh, the, this regional climate model at coarse resolution, we see on the top, so those are, uh, are Hofmuller diagrams of, uh, you know, precipitation in a, case, in a simulation without dust, and in a simulation with dust, okay, where you see this we uh, weather, uh, weather pattern uh, propagating from west to east, you know, the African easterly wave simulated quite roughly, I must say. But you see already that actually uh, the impact of dust is, uh, can be very variable depending on uh, the stage where we are in the monsoon season, okay, and this is in relation with the type of easterly wave in relation to the dust sources, you know, interacting. Okay, so there's intra-seasonal variability. And a lot of effort are also now 
devoted to a, a better characterization of dust and mesoscale convective system uh, interactions through direct, semi-direct, but also indirect effects, since dust are uh, efficient cloud nu nuclei. And actually, some studies, for example, based on mesoscale modeling, have shown actually that dust can impact the organization of mesoscale convective system, reducing the occurrence of uh, uh, co uh, conve strong convection, but when it happens, actually increasing the organization and leading to stronger events. Of course, the challenge now is like to, uh, to manage to, um, uh, to know actually what is the impact of this uh, you know, short-term interaction at a, cli a climatic uh, time scale. Because it is tricky because dust not only influence directly the clouds, but also the environment and at different time scales, okay? Uh, so for example, you can have, you know, um, uh, uh, convection inv invigoration induced by dust, uh, ice nuclei, but at the same time, convection can be inhibited uh, by a radiative effect of dust and cooling of the surface, okay? So it's all a matter of uh, integrating all of this now. <coughs> and for that, actually, uh, going towards the uh, regional climate and convection permitting simulation is very uh, is a promising tool actually. So now I'm talking about uh, longer term variability because it turns out uh, uh, if you look at the C uh, CMIP model that actually they are not able to uh, capture uh, the okay the the, the long term variability of uh, the global dust record. Okay, so here you, have, you see the record in the, in the gray uh, line, and you see all the same models, actually, that uh, do not uh, capture the main uh, peaks period of dust, uh, strong dust, uh, and stay quite flat, okay? If we go now in terms of projections, this uh, recent article from uh, Thorny et al. Uh, showed actually that same model calculate a very uh, low uh, uh, climate feedback parameter, uh, for dust. That means that in the future, okay, uh, there's a lot of model dispersion uh, on how dust are going to uh, respond to climate change. Okay, but we know that in the past, actually, that uh, dust is very much interactive with, with climate. Okay, so this point out actually is uh, to uh, limitation that can come from emission parametrization, from the vegetation feedback, also important for emission and also for the possible impact of uh, uh, unresolved processes, like for example, the cold pool and the convective emission, you know, the gust, uh, that actually is not resolved by uh, the course models, okay? But could be very sensitive to uh, climate change, okay? And by that, dust emission uh, could be also very sensitive, okay? And then after there is, um, of course, um, the, the problematic of the anthropogenic dust, okay, because we are talking about uh, natural aerosol here, but anthropogenic dust created by land use um, uh, change and uh, perturbation is also um, something to, uh, to be better characterized. Okay, so I wanted to tell you about biomass burning aerosol, but I think I did my time already. So if you are interested, I'm just gonna finish here just to uh, st uh, strengthen the fact that actually West Africa and the monsoon region is, ve is very interesting, uh, you know, and, and very complex um, thing. And that actually, that mixes, you know, some, um, uh, some, some uh, atmospheric chemistry, but also uh, some concerns about uh, the, the emission e evolution in, the, in this uh, very highly populated and uh, dynamic uh, region. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Excellent. So our next speaker um, is Erwan Koch. Um, uh, yeah, he's talking about actually, uh, um, uh, this is a work that we've worked on together. So <laughs> I'll leave the floor to you, Erwan. <laughs> so f f thanks a lot, Ryan, for the kind introduction. Actually, the point is that I first asked Ryan to present that, but he was too shy to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Pro pro chair, probably, <laughs> probably because it's, um, you know, as uh, extreme value theory is uh, quite a central topic in, uh, at Etche, uh, we thought that having a talk on, like, the use of extreme value theory would be valuable, but then it's less fancy 
uh, than many of the talks from an uh, atmospheric viewpoint, atmospheric science viewpoint. So that's why Ryan thought, okay, no, I'm not so confident to, to explain that here. So I will make a try. Um, it's, will, it's a statistical model, so max table fields are, so thanks also for still being here despite such a technical title. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, max table fields are, um, it's a class of, um, of models in extreme value theory. So the model I will present is again, um, somehow lacks flexibility compared to um, numer uh, numerical weather forecast models or uh, AI based approaches. But um, the advantage uh, is that we, we have easy interpretability, explicit uh, representation, we have co uh, you know, causal representation and so on. So, and the model is quite intuitive. Um, so let's uh, let's go. So the data we look at in in our application is uh, so ERA five reanalysis data. So it's a so-called ten meter wind gust since uh, previous post processing. So the really the important point to understand here is that it it ma it ca it must be interpreted as hourly maxima of three second wind gust speeds. And the fact that it's hourly maxima taken over three seconds, it means that it's all, it's maxima taken over basically 1,200 observations of three seconds, explaining why uh, extreme value theory, despite the strong dependence here, is still relevant for that. Uh, the period we look at, so basically we, it spans like 105 hours at the um, ERA-5 resolution of 0.5 degrees, latitude and longitude, and the region we, we, the region we consider is, is this uh, shaded area there. And here there is a, uh, an example, I mean, of snapshots during our period. And basically, so in, in red, you see high values of wind gusts and in blue, uh, low values. And the point I want to make here is, of course, uh, it's very important to be able to account for advection. Uh, you clearly see this propagation of uh, this front here from basically the west to uh, the southeast. And you, you see it very clearly and uh, of course, it's obvious for uh, an audience like you are, but for uh, statistician and, uh, statisticians and in the field of space-time maxable models, previous ones were not able to capture that aspect. So that's why I, uh, I'm, that I highlight it now. So the point is that we, we have a field of maxima, okay? Because we have hourly maxima, but at each of those grid points over there. So at the end, we have a field of pointwise maxima. And of course, I don't have time to go into the theory, but basically mathematical theory tells you that then the appropriate model for that is what we call the spatial max table field. But since here we want to do some forecasting, we need to be a space-time state setting, and we still need, so then we need to go one step further and to consider uh, space-time max table models. And the literature on those models is rather limited, and current models, uh, with current models, the temporal dynamics are typically unrealistic because there is no advection, as I mentioned earlier, and also these dynamics are not explicit and uh, very difficult to interpret. And if the dynamics are not explicit in statistical models, that make uh, forecasting very difficult. So the solution we propose here is a Markovian maxable field in space and time. Um, and the, we can show that the only Markovian max table fields in space and time are so-called max autoregressive models. And we add an advection term. So actually the model is not difficult to, uh, is rather, rather intuitive. So basically here, this W, you can basically omit what it is, but it just, just please accept that it's a special max table field, okay? Whatever it means, we call it, it's a so-called brown resnick field, okay? It's like an innovation process for, her, for, for, for us, but we don't need to understand in details, right? And then we consider a family of independent replications of that, that field. And then our max autoregressive model with advection, it's like rather simple. You have an initialization, so at time zero, you have a field, which is the innovation field W0, and then you have a recurrence equation that tells you that basically what happens at location S and time T, you see it's related to what happened at T minus one at location S minus, S minus tau, so basically you take your process, your field, and you shift it in space, right, to account for the propagation of spatial patterns, right? 
Um, here you have a parameter A that basically accounts for the influence of the past, and you have this innovation process here. Okay, so you see that it looks like an autoregressive process for those of you who know a bit uh, about like time series analysis, but here it's a max autoregressive because we have the max operator here. So we take a maximum of, of an attenuated version of the field at the previous time that shifted and an innovation, okay? So this tau here, you can interpret it as a velocity. So it's how uh, basically do the spatial patterns move uh, per unit of time, okay? So um, now I will show you some results comparing our model with one competitor model. Um, so what you have here, basically, so you can this look at that vector here, which has, uh, it, it basically, uh, shows the, the special lag 1 minus 0.5, okay? So basically, we consider one location here at the, at the beginning of the arrow and one location here, okay? And here, we look at the cross correlation, at the correlation between these two points, okay, for different time, time lags u. So basically, you take the time series um, here at that point, and you, you compute the correlation with the time series at that point by lagged by a certain amount of time, okay? And you see that our competitor model, because it cannot capture advection, it shows complete, a complete symmetric pattern. But of course, when you have a propagation of special effects, you expect some asymmetry right in the data, because actually the green one is the velocity vector we estimated from our data, which means that special patterns move into that direction. So, of course, uh, in one hour. So, of course, you expect what happens here to be correlated with what happens there one hour later, right? But not one hour before. So that's why you have this asymmetry here. And since basically the vector we have chosen here is basically three times this one, that's why here we have our maximum correlation, uh, correlation for time lag, which is three, with our model, which is in blue, our competitor, again, is in red, and data are in black um, with 95% confidence interval uh, depicted by the shaded area. So you see here that uh, we are able to, to be more realistic in terms of uh, spatial temporal dependent structure. Uh, we can have um, a correlation which is maximum not only at zero, but can be at an overlag, and we are able to account for this asymmetry. Here is the same, uh, but now instead of taking the lag, the previous one, now we, we look at that direction, so from the west to the east, uh, which is not exactly in the direction of the flow anymore, but still the same kind of conclusions can be drawn that uh, basically our model captures uh, rather well that what's going on in terms of, of asymmetry of the, of the space-time dependent structure, um, and the, the competitor model is, uh, is rejected basically by, uh, by, by a, a test which, was, which would be based on these 95% confidence intervals. Um, the, then the, se se the next step was in terms of forecasting. So here on the left you have our model, I mean you have the scatter plots of observations um, and predictions for our model on the left and our competitor on the right for lags from one hour to uh, seven hours. And we see that um, basically the, let's say, the improvement of our model compared to the other is m more and more striking when you go to high, higher time lags. You, you, you see that uh, using the other model, uh, after seven hours, for seven hours, basically it does not capture anything because there is no uh, inherent dynamics in, in, in the model, right? Whereas we are still able to capture uh, a bit what's, what's, what's going on there. Um, and here you, you have the comparison of the mean CRPS. So basically we have considered 2,000 space-time points uh, to, to do a, a forecasting exercise. And we have computed the mean CRPS over, over these 2,000 space-time points. You have our model in blue and the competitor model in red. And, and as expected, you see quite a substantial um, decrease of, 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 the, um, of the error um, over there. So in, in conclusion, I would say that 
of course, it's an uncomplicated model somehow. I mean, it's complex from a mathematical viewpoint, but it's uncomplicated in, in, in terms of writing and in terms of parameters, because at the end, if we go back to the model, uh, here we have only uh, this parameter, which is a real tau, which is a vector in R2. And then something I, I, I did not mention is that here we, we work in a standardized space uh, where everything is standard fresh air, so because we account only for the space-time dependence structure, we, we ha I, don't, I didn't talk about the margins, basically we are, which are generalized extreme value distributions, but I, I, I didn't uh, mention that. But in terms of number of parameters, you see that it's a very simple model. Um, it has an explicit dynamics because it's Markovian, max autoregressive, it's interpret and, and interpretable. And of course we can also um, in our forecasting strategy, we can generate ensemble very easily. Um, but, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, perhaps to some of you it doesn't appear to be so fancy because, of course, it's much less flexible than any uh, AI uh, or data-driven strategy that are used currently for now casting or uh, numerical weather forecast models that Im implement the whole physics, right? So to make it more realistic from an operational viewpoint, of course, there are future directions which would be uh, to, to treat our parameters as random or at least uh, allowing them to be locally specific and also to relax some assumptions of our field because, again, if I come back here, um, our innovation process W, which is uh, basically the process at time zero, right, and then which is shifted, um, this process now is considered to be stationary in space and, of course, this is, I mean, it's, it was okay for our application, right, on our domain here, because what happens over there is rather stationary, but it's in terms of dependent structure, but it's, of course, it's a drawback, and to make it more realistic for real uh, weather forecast applications, it's, uh, yeah, for sure it's, uh, it's um, further work would be needed, but, I mean, it's a paper that we will submit in the coming days for, for a statistical journal, um, so, yeah, and here are some references related to what I, I said. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope it was okay for the audience. Yes, Ayub is uh, our last speaker of the day from uh, Detect, uh, and he's going to speak to us about geospatial data, well, compression of geospatial data in a more information theoretic uh, yeah. uh, framework. So yeah, I'm excited to hear it. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So, uh, as we saw today, like we've seen a lot of like experiments and uh, simulations, and with that, like we are generating a lot of data, and the one crucial part is like we are always taking uh, like as simple is like the data storage. So that's why we are talking today about the compression of data. So uh, like according to the ECMWF website, like with the archives, like we are having like. 400 terabytes of data being added daily to the archive. So that's a lot of data. And like this graph from uh, Milan Kluver paper, like it's showing how it's the ECMWF uh, data is growing. And it's like, we'll be soon uh, entering the exabyte uh, mark and like it's going to enter the Google regime. So uh, before going like to uh, compression, I was just to give a small reminder of like how we uh, compress the data and like before that how the data is stored on computers, like binary uh, representation of the data. So in here I'm taking like uh, float numbers in 16 bits. So we have the sine bit and the uh, exponent and the mantissa. So uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I will just skip this slide. And uh, for the compression, it's like just getting uh, less information on the disk. And this has like some uh, results in uh, like the uh, capacity of the storage and the, uh, uh, like the, uh, the input and output. And uh, for that, uh, the, for the compression, there is like a three dimension to that, like uh, there is the precision, the size reduction, and the compression, the compression speeds. So uh, in uh, the goal is like to have uh, 
like all of these uh, components to the, a minimum, but uh, it's not always the case and uh, it's dependent on your application and uh, you just strike a balance between those. Uh, so for that, I will be presenting uh, like the bitwise real information uh, compression. So it consists of three steps. The first one is like we calculate the bitwise information between the uh, the bits, uh, and we discard the bits with that, that we uh, we say that that have no information, like depending on threshold that we choose, and then we do our lossless compression. So for that, like we uh, assume we have uh, graded data, and uh, in this grid, we will be calculating the bit information for each like bit uh, position. So we do that by uh, like this bit information between the bits. It's like we have more mutual information between a bit and its neighboring if there is like uh, correlation and dependence between the bits. And this is uh, like we have real information. And uh, if the bits just appear randomly, that uh, means that we don't have like uh, real information, but just false information. And the mutual information is zero. And uh, basically, the idea we choose uh, like uh, a threshold that we want, like 99, 99.9. .9, and we just discard all the uh, uh, all the other bits. Yeah. So uh, for uh, like getting this idea clearly, I have a small example. So we have data like uh, that's shown like this, and we do our calculation to uh, conserve just like 99%. Like we see that we have uh, uh, yeah the, the this number of bits like the first ones like the blue and the black ones. And uh, all the other red ones are to be discarded. And uh, we can uh, think of the compression. It will be done something like this, but not necessarily like this. And uh, we, we are going like from uh, 160 bits to just 60 bits. And like the blue and the black, uh, like the number of bits that we are choosing, it's called the key bits. So that we'll be using a lot in the next uh, section. Yeah, so uh, this this work has been done uh, like on full data sets. And for this project that I was part of, we tried like to uh, use the, this compression on like small chunks of a data set. So that's what I will be showing here. Uh, so we have this uh, convective precipitation. Uh, we have calculated the uh, the bitwise compression. We have uh, found like that we will be choosing like eight key bits for the full data sets. Mm -hmm. But when we have done our uh, like chunking on the, uh, the chunk, uh, the compression on the chunking, we have found like that we can see like the Arctic and Antarctic, we have like a lot of zero key bits. So we don't need like lo more of the bits in there. But uh, in other areas, like we have more than the general key bits that we saw in the uh, uh, full data set. And uh, we can see like we have uh, uh, like a similar ratio of compression, but uh, as we have seen in the, uh, like the previous slide, we, we are like having a flexibility, flexibility of how many key bits and precision we are uh, uh, having. And uh, another uh, variable will be the direct solar radiation. So uh, the key bits was in here uh, 12, I think, for the full data set. And uh, when we have uh, applied the chunking, uh, we found also like there is like uh, some areas with a uh, m lot of more key bits and others with less. And uh, this one, uh, we have achieved like uh, a bigger ratio of compression with the, our chunking method. And uh, in the next slide is the same variable. And here I'm showing uh, like that. Uh, in, so in the first half, we have like the compression like of the full data set. 
but in the second half we have the uh, with the chunking that I did we can see the chunks on the first uh, one and we can see like using different uh, percentage as thresholds we can achieve uh, different uh, uh, ratio uh, compression ratios and as you can see in the last one like if you choose like a smaller ratio 83 you can uh, you will start having like some artifacts and you are losing a lot of data uh, and this is an analysis we did like for uh, and, uh, some other variables so we can uh, see that like most of the time we have like bigger ratios of compression using the chunking but not always as for the uh, uh, yeah as for some variables in here and then we have also explored like 2D chunking and also on levels. So here we have the specific humidity. We can see like that the uh, key bits uh, on the chunks, they're uh, variable like in each uh, latitude, longitude in each level. And you can see different distribution with each level. Uh, and uh, this is another one. Uh, showing like the uh, distribution of the key bits uh, in different levels like so for the uh, ozone mass mixing ratio and the specific humidity we have like you can see in the first levels uh, we have the chunks are uh, towards like the uh, uh, small key bits but in the, th the three last layers it's having uh, more key bits but this is uh, not always working as uh, for the temperature variable in orange. Uh, so we, are, we can see like in, uh, it's similar in uh, most of the levels. And as a summary, like uh, the bitwise real information content based compression, like you do it by just calculating the bitwise information and get your key bits and uh, you discard the bits without real information and you do a lossless compression and uh, the chunking can enhance the compression and give you more flexibility to trade off like compression and uh, accuracy where needed thank you okay so we are at the end of this event um, in the name of the whole CLIMAC team, I want to thank you for your participation. It's always a pleasure for us to organize that event uh, year after year, because uh, the, not only because the, the ambience is so uh, good and, 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 and smooth, but also because we uh, discuss a diversity of subjects. Um, I mean, just today we went from uh, weather extremes to climate resilience strategies. We covered neural weather models, and we even have a PowerPoint in German. I mean, we covered it all. Um, Climact, also, I wanted to, to tell you that Climact is closing at the end of the, the year, on the 31st of December. Uh, so we hope, we very much hope that uh, ECHE is gonna, will have the opportunity and the resources to hold uh, this event next year, or some similar events because we think that it's a great opportunity to discuss and also for networking. As I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the day, we offer uh, diverse coffee breaks and the apéro and we really try to, to have a dynamic event to create uh, uh, synergies amongst our community. So that's, that's something that is very important for us. Uh, the climate team remains available until the end of the year. If you want to do outreach or communication about your research, please don't hesitate to, uh, to talk to us and uh, to communicate with us. Uh, apart from that, um, also I wanted to mention about that there are going to be more formal communication about the closure of, uh, of climate. So you, you'll hear about us in uh, formal, uh, more formal ways in the coming weeks. Uh, apart from that, I wanted to thank the the whole um, HA team, uh, Fatih also for your help, Isabel and Aisha working with me every day. It's always great to, to organize events with you. Michi for jumping in such last minute uh, to replace Luca. And also we have a special thank you for uh, uh, my, my, my close colleagues organizing this. Ervan, Tom and Hendrik, we have uh, small gifts for you guys. Thank you. Here we 
you go. And uh, one last logistical point for today. I'm done after that, promise. Uh, don't forget, please, to vote. You have the voting cards uh, for your two best presentations and posters. You'll still have about uh, half an hour to uh, have a look at the posters. Please get back uh, with your uh, voting cards by, let's see, uh, four, let's see, six, well, yeah, four thirty, four thirty, and then we're gonna have uh, like five minutes, me and Isabel, to count down everything, and we're gonna have the poster and presentation awards. Thank you very much for today. I leave the floor to uh, my colleagues. Okay, so I will keep it short. Um, so thanks a lot to all of you for being here today uh, for the great presentation, for the audience, the great questions, all the nice exchanges. Um, so for sure, uh, we will try as Eche to to do as as well as Climact has, has been doing for this event and to continue the tradition about that. Um, for this edition, really a special thanks to the Climact team because us as Eche, we joined like already at a time where a lot of work had been done. So, so a huge thanks, especially to Charmili and Isabel for um, really a lot of, of great work. So thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot to both of you. <laughs> and thanks also to, to my colleagues, Tom and, and, and Rick, and uh, the whole ETSHE team. Um, so I think I will just hand over. I'm, yeah, just perhaps an an announcement for our future ETSHE events. So we will have an ETSHE weather club, so in collaboration with Meteo Suisse next Tuesday. So um, Lionel Perrault from uh, the Center West in Geneva forecast will present us. I mean, it will, it will be very attractive. It's on the famous 41 millimeters in 10 minutes from the 11th of June, 2018. So, you know, this record-breaking event in Lausanne. Uh, so it will like analyze the synoptic conditions and the more local conditions leading to, to that event. Um, yeah, so I will leave the floor to, to my colleagues. Thanks a lot to, to all of you, and uh, we meet at the apero. Okay, so also from my side, thanks for coming. Uh, I think it, so far we had really a, a very interesting day, great talks, and there are also great posters outside. Uh, I can promise that. Um, the voting has already been announced, but already I can already tell you that uh, one vote is already completed, and we have an anonymous um, result, and that's for the best meeting organization. <laughs> so once again, Charmili and Isabel, thank you very much for that. And give me just one second, because we have a different cachette than yours. <laughs> and while Hendrik reveals a surprise, oh, it's too late. Thank you, Charmili. Thank you, Isabel. We're so lucky to organize the Atmospheric Science Day with you every year. And so the drinks are also ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you all again. Uh, really, please have a look at the poster while you enjoy the apéro. It's really important. We have so many talented students, postdocs, who will be presenting their posters right after this. Um, and then because of the a handover uh, of the event to Eche and, and EPFL still, um, we may not have the formal post-event survey that we normally do, but we really still care about your opinion. So uh, please don't hesitate to email us if you have ideas on how to make this event better, who to invite. So we always try to invite some groups from ETH or Bern or Meteor Swiss. It's always a pleasure to welcome them. So just email me or Hendrik or Erwan, and we'll do our best to take that into account in the next edition of the Atmospheric Science Day. Thank you so much. Thank you.